The International Legion is truly international. While in the English-speaking press, the American and British volunteers are usually the most highlighted, the Legion, and the Ukrainian military more broadly, have volunteers from all over the globe. Many are closer to Ukraine, like from the neighboring Belarus, Poland, Chechnya, Georgia, and even Russia itself. Some come from much farther away, with some volunteers coming from as far away as Japan, Taiwan, Colombia, and Brazil. The motivations for people leaving the safety of their homes to fight in the largest war in Europe since World War II vary. Some, like many Chechen and Georgian volunteers, believe that their struggle against Russian occupation in Ukraine will help their struggle against Russian occupation in their home countries. The Belarusian regiment's motto is First Ukraine, then Belarus, in reference to the idea that defeating Russia in Ukraine is a step forward in releasing Russian influence over Belarus. Other volunteers were motivated into action by atrocities committed by the Russian military, believing that they are defending a young democracy or fear that their country could be invaded next if Ukraine should fall. No single reason is all-encompassing for all the volunteers. With thousands picking up arms, each person will have their own path to the trenches and urban hellscapes of wartime Ukraine. Today's interview subject is a prime example of that. Alex Silva is from Brazil. He served in the Brazilian military before disillusion with Brazil and the allure of good pay attracted him into work as a private military contractor and got him employment working in Afghanistan during the US intervention. Afterwards, he would seek employment as a PMC in Ukraine in 2016, two years after the invasion of Crimea and the start of the war in the Donbass. During his time in Ukraine, he would meet his soon-to-be wife before deciding to settle down in the country permanently. The Russian invasion of 2022 once again sent him into harm's way, this time not as a contractor, but as a volunteer who says he is now fighting for his new home. I'm Dylan Burns, and this is Ukraine Uncensored. Again, thank you so much for taking time to sit down and do this interview today. Let's start with you uh, saying your name and when you first came to Ukraine. Yeah, my name is Alex Silva. I came to Ukraine in 2016. And uh, basically I come here because I was in some other countries around, like Poland, for example. Have some training over there. What kind of training? Uh, I have like PMC, CQB training. So I used to go in different PMC as in private military company private military company but this was just a training center mm -hmm. and then i come to ukraine also to see here how is the training here how is the schools and the kind of training center then i like the country and i stayed this was in 2016. so in 2016 when you were i don't you weren't working for a pmc but you had some training with the pmc you come to ukraine you what what kind of work were you doing in, in 2016 when you first came here uh, PMC so so you were working for a private military company yeah. gotcha what type of work I, I obviously I, I doubt you can talk too much about ex exactly what company you're working for but what type of work were you doing in 2016 uh, some kind of work like uh, uh, do the security in some compounds and few good countries gotcha. <laughs> in what the did, Middle East what did you like about the country Ukraine, I like uh, especially the people, man. Mm -hmm. People here is f just fucking awesome people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just unbelievable. People here is very kind. You know, you go in any small like a uh, town or village, people here they treat you so well. You know, this is one of the big reasons I still live here in this country, and I believe in the future of this country too. So you're from Brazil, am I correct? Yeah, I'm from Brazil. Is there a lot of support in Brazil for Ukraine? I know that uh, there are a few uh, people from Brazil who have come over here to uh, serve in the Legion. Basically, we have right now, I think about 30 or 40 Brazilian guys here in, in Ukraine, fight for Ukraine. They have other ones also, they come to fight, but they left. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they go and they come back, sometimes not. Um, People in Brazil, uh, I think most of the people, they support Ukraine, but many people they don't know because I think it's too far, you know, mm -hmm. from Ukraine, it's too far from the Brazilian reality, I think. Uh, people there in Brazil is a decent people, you know, but uh, the government, man, is just 
unbelievable garbage. Mm -hmm. This is the word that I have for the government in Brazil. And I'm like, uh, right now this government over there is 100% pro-Russia. They say they, they said they are uh, neutral in the war, mm -hmm. you know, but they are not. I see like, I'll give an example to you. Okay? We're talking about um, Lula da Silva's government? Lula da Silva is a completely thief. He's a criminal. Mm -hmm. uh, Bolsonaro, for me, I don't like politicians, you know, mm -hmm. like Bolsonaro also is not like a, the good guy that people think. Mm -hmm. You know, both for me is just two idiots, but Lula is much worse, you know, uh, because he's a completely criminal and also he support, you know, the communist parties and the kind of stuff, you know, and he support Russia. And now uh, he's trying to buy a lot of diesel from Russia, man. It's just unbelievable. So he said he's neutral in the war, you know, he don't want to get involved, but in the same time, this man, he finance you know, Putin mm -hmm. and his uh, war machine. So this is basically what happened now. When you came over here uh, in 2016, uh, I assume at some point you, you did leave or were you have you been here ever since then? Because I, I assume at some point when the Russians invaded in 2022 of last year, you came back at, at some point, right? Yes. When did you come back? Uh, no, I, I live here since 2016. Oh, so you've lived here yeah, yeah, since yeah, yeah. 2016. So since you've been here since 2016 yes. consistently yeah. working and the front here is not uh you know for me it's nothing new because over there like a few years ago mm -hmm. you know in 2016 17 i saw what happened there you know so i joined some uh, volunteers also and uh, with other volunteers from some other countries you know i joined some battalion here and i saw with my eyes what's going on there since 2017 basically mm -hmm. and uh, when the russians invade uh, ukraine uh, last year so i was in my apartment with my wife she's ukrainian and basically i saw the whole thing when you uh saw the invasion happen in 2022 when when the russians uh, obviously it wasn't the first invasion but when they expanded the invasion was that a big surprise to you did you expect it to happen were you shocked when it happened all right this is the thing here man i have uh, some ukrainian friends and those ukrainian friends they really believe the russians is gonna just prepare and attack ukraine at some point you know and i have uh, uh, my friend Vasil, you know, he's like history, he likes, uh, you know, his country very much. And in 2016, when I met him for the first time, because he used to work in, the, uh, uh, in this training center, he told me, uh, sooner or later, Russia is going to invade Ukraine, you know, for, and this is exactly what happened. I really expected the Russians attacking Ukraine at some point, you know. Uh, Things getting, you know, like uh, complicated here in this country since, you know, last year. I mean, uh, it was not easy, especially last year. You know, in this city we have, you know, no electricity, sometimes no water, you know, sometimes uh, it's pretty hard when, especially when you live in the 20th floor. Mm -hmm. And it's no easy when you don't have electricity, no elevator, man. So. Since you've been here since 2016, I would assume that you've, you know, you've been along the front line and seen the conditions and how they've changed over the last couple of years from when it was a lot more stagnant or frozen, not completely frozen, but semi-frozen, to what it is now. How has the war changed since what it was like in 2016, 2017, in that time period? Uh, from 2017 to 2022, you think? Yeah, how has the war changed over time? In those years, you know, until last year was basically frozen, you know, was some exchange here, exchange, I mean, like some shoot out of here, some shoot out over there, guys shoot each other, blah, 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 but not a big deal. But when this full scale invasion start in uh, February 24 of 2022, mm -hmm. I think what affected the most was I think the heat, you know, the mind of people here in Ukraine, something really hit hard, like, okay, we have a war. 
because before, especially people they live in Kiev and the west of Ukraine, they don't realize, you know, we have a war, you know, like because everything was froze, but it was not froze. The war continued over there because it was troops over there in Donbas, you know. Well, I think this was the, the, the most, um, uh, how I can say, the um, hardy thing or I don't know. I don't I don't know the word. Sometimes I forget. Was difficult, English. hard? It was too difficult and uh, they show the reality to people. Mm -hmm. You know, like, because some people really don't realize, you know. We have an example, for example, in the West, you know, in Lviv. You want to walk? Huh? Go, 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 go take a little walk. Go, 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 go take a walk. This is our new friend here. What's his name? Uh, Konyak. What do you think? Huh? I, I like the name. Would you have chosen something different? No, I really like the name. Too. <laughs> you know, he's a cool cat. Um, so the 2022 invasion happens. You were doing work with private military companies. You, you've been working here since 2016. Once the war really kicks off and it's no longer a frozen conflict, but an active conflict across the whole country, what do you do? In 2022, yes, yeah, 2022. Okay, this is the thing. First day, okay, of the invasion. So I live in close to Irping, very close, like five kilometers from my balcony. I can see what happened over there. I saw the helicopters. I saw all this artillery. I saw a lot of shooting. You know, was crazy. So you were living right along the front line. Yes, you know. And uh, I saw exactly what happened in Bucha and Hostmel Airport because I live close to those places, you know, like five kilometers from Irping, 10 kilometers from Bucha, about 10 kilometers from the Hostmel Airport. I used to fly drones very close to the airport over there, you know, before the war. So I really saw what happened, you know, like things was unbelievable crazy, you know. When I wake up in the morning, just to have idea, I wake up with my dogs barking, you know, I say, what's going on here, you know? And I heard like, boom, boom, but I don't realize for like 30 seconds, I was thinking it was a thunder or something, you know, like, this is maybe a thunder, it's gonna was rain. Was this on something. February 24th? 24th, so this is the day in the morning, like five o'clock in the morning. I say, about five, six o'clock in the morning, something like that. I say, oh, what is that? You know, then I realized was the invasion. Did did you have to see like a news report first, or when you when you did you realize it independently? Or? I realized right away. You know, like just after thirty seconds, when I wake up with my dogs, you know, barking, and then I first I thought it was a thunder. Then I realized it was a war just next to my door, and that thing was crazy for me. So what I did in that day, I leave my wife and her parents, took my car in the morning, come to some um, military base to be a volunteer. Then they sent me to other place. The other place was uh, territory defense. So I joined the Ukrainian army basically. Uh, territorial defense or the formal like territorial defense gotcha. you know I, I today is part of army basically every territorial defense mm -hmm. but at the time it was just a group of civilians and some military also they joined you know they got together to defend the country and this is exactly what i did in that morning i can say i was one of the first foreigners to fight for ukraine and i mean this full-scale invasion mm -hmm. because in the first day I just get some rifle and I start to defend this country once again. Since there, I just, you know, join other battalions and other territorial defenses. And now I'm here in the Foreign Legion. I work also with the humanitarian for a few months and I decide to fight once again. You said that you had to, you know, you left your wife. Is, is your wife in Ukraine? Do you have a, a, a wife that lives here? Yeah, she's Ukrainian and she lives here. When did you, did you meet her once you started working in the country? Did you know her beforehand? I met her, you know, just a couple of weeks after I got here in Ukraine in 2016. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we started a relationship and after six months we get married and we still live together after all those years. What does she think about your work? Uh, she's okay. I think Ukrainian uh, woman, you know, it's like 
tough woman and they understand, you know, like uh, when the man, you know, have some different profession, like I have, this is not like common profession, you know, like how many people in the world, they work as a PMC or work as a security, you know, like international security or something like that. There's no many. So she really understand, people here understand. Um, this country, they have some kind of culture, you know, like for people be tough, be strong, you know. I think they have so many invasions in the past in this country and people get pretty hard and pretty strong. So it's not like a big deal if you say you PMC or you international security or something like that. I give example to you. Her uh, grandfather, he uh, used to be one of those uh, soldiers in the Red Army in the Soviet Union. He fought uh, against uh, the uh, Germanies in uh, 1944. So, and then her father in the 80s uh, also was in the, uh, the Soviet army and he was in Germany for some time. And so basically she coming from a military family and she knows what's going on. So she has an experience with having family members in service. Yeah, she do have some experience. Her brother also was in the service, you know, like a few years ago. So she what what about your friends. family that's back in Brazil? I imagine you still have some family back in yes. Brazil. What do they think of all of this? Uh, my mother, I try to don't uh, tell her much about the war. You know, she asked me, of course, she's very worried, you know, about the situation here, but I never tell her, you know, I, of course, she knows something because I give an interview for some TV, some, for some Brazilian TV last year, and it was a uniform and everything with a weapon, and she saw that, you know, and of course she got... Did worried. she not know that you were serving in the uh, in the military at that point no she find out when i give the interview oh, so she found out through a third party through the interview yeah, exactly yeah. that must have been a difficult conversation yeah she um, don't like of course you know but i explained to her so what is the situation here i need to defend my family here plus defend the country plus defend my life so this is the country that i choose to live so i have to defend the country and defend the people here too Especially if you have more skills than other people, you know, so I think I have more skills than most of people here because from your history with PMCs? Yeah, yes, you know, I mean also uh, an Instructor for firearms and CQB and that kind of stuff here, you know, so uh, When I started to work here in Ukraine in 2016 the training center So people in the training said I come here to training Mm -hmm. To no. train people? No, I come here just to train. Just yourself to train yes. in 2016? Yes, exactly. Because I was in Poland, I have a training over there in Poland in 2016, yes. Look, before working in, in, with PMCs, did you have formal military experience in Brazil? I joined the uh, military service in Brazil, but was in the 90s. But, you know, the Brazilian army, uh, they don't have much experience in any wars or anything, basically. Mm -hmm. Basically, the, when you join the Brazilian army, it's, uh, what do you do over there? Basically nothing, man. You know, you just a country, they never join any uh, war, you know, with anyone. They have never got involved, especially in the last, what, 70 years. I think the last war in Brazil fight was uh, World War II. And this is what eighty years ago, mm -hmm. and before there was, I don't know, maybe when Brazil was a monarchy. This is more than a hundred years ago, so we don't have a, a history of war and get involved in some wars, mm -hmm. and uh, especially those new generations that have no idea what's war. Mm -hmm. You know, so when you join the Brazilian army, you just stay in the base, you go home. You know that kind of thing. Would you say it's a very like kind of secure, safe type of work in the Brazilian army? Yeah, something like that. I don't want to criticize the Brazilian army because I have friends there also. You know. Um, well, I don't think it's a criticism to say they're not fighting wars. That's not necessarily a bad thing, is it? No, it's not a bad thing, of course. You know, but um, I'm I'm very concerned about the uh, the high command in the Brazilian army. To be honest with you, I don't think these people. It's, honest you know the generals mm -hmm. you know in the brazilian army i think it's a bunch of corrupts mm -hmm. like the russian army i think it's the same thing 
Now, I don't want to delve too much into Brazilian uh, history. Do you think any of that has is like a holdover from uh, when the military had more control of the country in the military dictatorship period? Do you think this is a more recent development, this type of corruption? Uh, I think they're coming from a long time, man. you know. I think more than a hundred years when these people uh, made a coup against the uh, the monarchy in the country. Since they're just, I just don't believe in the Brazilian army, basically. You yeah. don't believe in it? No, I don't. Got you. Is that why you joined the PMC? Yes. Got you. you know, so I, I like the kind of things. I like uh, military, I like weapons, you know. You enjoy this type of work? I do, a lot. I think it's a nice work. To some people who, you know, don't have experience in the military or maybe, you know, war is very like a foreign concept to them. That might be a weird thing to hear that you would, you know, enjoy working with guns or working with militaries and, and this type of work. Can you explain that enjoyment at all? Okay, this is the thing. Uh, when I say I really enjoy that, mm -hmm. uh, I like a lot of things. For example, I like the friends I make mm -hmm. because we make a lot of good, of good friends on this kind of work. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you can travel to different places, you know, it's not easy when you have the kind of situation we have here because war is not is not funny, you know. It's no for fun. I, some people really believe it's oh I gonna I go to Ukraine and have fun over there. I saw a bunch of guys here, man. They coming from different countries and the guys was like oh I go to the war I gonna fight I gonna fight yeah 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 I gonna kill Russians. I say please just calm down. When you get there in the front, you're gonna see the reality. Because there is a shit, you know, there is real shit. People kill, people die, you know, it's not a joke. But some guys don't realize that. They just realize when they get there. And some of those guys just quit in the first day. I saw like a few guys quit. Quit on literally the first day of first combat. Day. Last week, man, was an example. Some guy, you know, was in my, my battalion, you know, so... Uh, I give a ride to him to Kiev, uh, and he just stayed one day. So oh, this not. He served me. for one day and then he and then he quit. One day. Did he have any military experience? Was he somebody? Yeah, he was in Afghanistan and Iraq. That's something I, I do want to ask a bit about in a bit. The difference between you know counterinsurgency <laughs> conflicts and the type of conflict here, because I've talked to a lot of foreign legionnaires with experience in Afghanistan and Iraq who are like, this is a totally different war. Totally different. Completely different. But I want to I want to get back to uh, to the timeline here. So the Russians invade. You join the territorial defense. Uh, what was those early days, that type of combat like when the Russians were marching on Kiev? What was your first military engagement like? What was you know the organizational structure? Was it an organized response? Was it somewhat chaotic? How were the Russians performing in that period? What what was it like then? Okay, the Russians uh, basically they get confused and I think a little lost here in Kiev. What I mean, little lost because. Uh, this people really believe they come here to fight Nazis. L let me give you one uh, example to you. Uh, not too far from where I live, you know, they have um, um, this avenue that goes straight to the center of Kiev, right? And and this, in some point over there in this avenue, they have a metro station. They call Bidistaiska. Mm -hmm. Bidistaiska military station. And close to this Bidistaiska military station, they have a military base. Right? And this is a true story. Some uh, Russian uh, official, officer, excuse me, some um, Russian officer, he stopped, you know, this uh, armor vehicle. I, I, don't, I don't remember if it was an armor vehicle or tank or something like that in front of this military base. He got a megaphone and he speak with the guys over there. He said, uh, please uh, just surrender and join us. We come here to help you guys and arrest and kill the Nazis. So the soldiers over there, they just look at each other and say, what the fuck are you talking about? And all the Russians get killed, of course, because the Ukrainians just kill all those crazy Russians that really believe they come to Ukraine to save Ukrainian people from the Nazis. I think people in Russia is so brainwashed, so brainwashed. Now it's a different story because they, now they realize, you know, they don't come here to fight any Nazis. 
You don't think that they believe that anymore, that, that no, there's Nazis don't. here? Do you think that idea has been kind of smashed in their head? Yes, because they saw the reality. When people fight in Kherson, for the Russians fight in Kherson, people there was 100% against Russians. They said, no, we don't want to join you fucking Russia. We want to stay in Ukraine. I'm Ukrainian. There's no Nazis here. It's just babushkas, women, men, kids. You see here, you idiots. Then I think these people start to realize that. And when they see also the Ukrainians fight for the country, for the land, you know, like they see it's no like it's completely bullshit. Another example is my friend Natalia. When the Russians capture Irping, she was there in Irping, mm -hmm. you know. She tell me few she told me a few stories, you know, in few different situations she had with the Russians over there. You know, I'll give you one example to you. One day the Russians come to, to her, you know, she have her parents they have a house over there in, in Yerpin. Mm. And then the Russians come, was about 20 people in this house, was, you know, a few neighbors plus her family over there, her husband, you know, mother, father, you know, brothers and everything in this house. So the Russians try to keep everyone inside the house. All right. Why? Because uh, they use these people as a human shield. One of the Russians, they said that to her. They said, listen, it's good if you everyone is staying inside the house. First of all, you have to wear this uh, white strap in your arm. They were telling the, the civilians to yes. put on the white strap that identifies Russian soldiers. Identify, I don't know what, if it's a Russian soldier or just to show like, uh, I don't know what. Some sort of support or something. I don't know, it's something like that, you know. So they make people wear this kind of thing in the army. And they're asking also the people like that, say, if you, you guys uh, go like in numbers outside the house, we're going to shoot all. If you want to go to some market or something or go to the street, do something, you have to go one by one. The rest of people have to stay inside the house. Why they say that? Because they try to use these people as a human shield. The Russian soldier, they say that to her. They said, listen, if you guys stay here, the Ukrainians don't shoot us. They said that openly. They admitted that. Yes. And you said, but you said they were making them put on the white armbands that the Russians wear yes. that identify Russian soldiers. Would they have to wear that when they went to the market if they wanted to go outside? Exactly. Couldn't, couldn't that reasonably make them look like an enemy combatant and confuse Can be. Ukrainian forces? Yeah. So these Russians is completely dirty. These are dirty soldiers. These are dirty people. You know, another example I give to you. There, one of those uh, Russians, they told her, say, listen, we can rape you, we can kill you, we can rob you, we can do whatever we want here. Because Putin, he said that to us. I don't know if he, you know, he, said, he heard this from some commander or something like that. But she was like very afraid to those Russians rape her, kill uh, her husband or, you know, her family and everything. Because a lot of people there, they got killed by those bastards. I saw it with my own eyes. One thing that really pissed me off, man, it's when people in the West, they say, ah, oh, this is fake. Oh, those pictures are fake. Ah, oh, this is never happening. You know, I saw it with my eyes because I, f I fight over there in, in European. Mm -hmm. And I saw people get, people was tied like this. With their arms tied behind their back. Yes. There's a lot of footage of people like born, burnt corpses after the Russians left. Um, the Russians at the time said, oh, this was actually the Ukrainians that did it. And then they like, you know, they made it look like it was the Russians. Um, what did the locals tell you when you when you talked to them about it, if you talked to locals about it and, and what you saw personally? Look, I remember in uh, March of last year, mm -hmm. right? one of the guys then uh, used to be with us, who were in the special forces here in Ukraine. Uh, and I used to uh, do some operations with him and other couple of guys. Right? Uh, t before 2022 or during? Uh, during the war, in gotcha. March of last year, right? gotcha. the end of March. So his brother have a house in Bucha. Right? Mm -hmm. 
So when we, uh, one of those days in the end of March, we drove a car over there, okay? We, because we know, this is the thing, this is why you, the Russians are getting really fucked here in this region. Because the local people, you know, they know everything, everywhere. For example, I know every trail, every place, every street near where I live, even in the woods. You know, I walk sometimes with my dogs in the woods, like 10 kilometers inside the woods. I know every single trail, and the Russians they don't know that. So, when we get to uh, his brother's house, it was a nice house with some sauna, you know, with um, the two different places outside. The, nice, the brother nice of the special operator that you were working with? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, his brother is a lawyer here, so have a decent life. When we get in his house, the Russians just took, the, of course, washer machine, like always, all the electronics. Can I ask about the, what, what's up with the washing machines? It seems like every clip I've seen of looting, it's washing machines. Why washing machines? Uh, I don't know, man. I think these people, they don't have the kind of things over there in Russia. Some of those Russians, they uh, used to fight here. They're coming from fucking far away in the east, like Siberia or something like, like Tuva that. Tuva or like areas like that. Exactly. It's more or less those people that look like Asian, you know, and uh, I don't think these people over there, they never see the kind of things like a washer machine or something. And when they Not come, a lot of wealth in that area? Not a lot of like financial wealth, so they don't no, able to afford it. They don't have. I, I don't think they have even uh, a store to buy those kind of things over there in that region. You know, this is what I think. Because why do you get a washer machine? Why you get uh, a toilet? This is insane. You know, like for us, they live in the West, but those people they stolen it. Uh, uh, those uh, toilets, they steal. They stealing. Toilets, washer machines, any electronics in the houses, you know. So you ask me what people told me over there in the, in that region. Okay, yeah. uh, let me give some examples to you. Experience what I have with people there. Right? I remember uh, this um, old woman and some old man also was a bunch of neighbors over there. You know, they come, you know, to us with bags of carrots, potato, uh, apple, you know, just to appreciate what we did to them. They, they say, thank you so much. The little food that these people have, man, they try to share with us. We don't took, we even giving more food to them because we have in the car, mm -hmm. you know, like normally when we used to do operations here, we have food in the car for three days. And sometimes we do operation one day, sometimes two days, but we have plenty of food in the car. And normally, you know, usually we give to the people, to, we share with the people in the streets over there. Uh, so this was, uh, for me, like, I don't say like, uh, I was shocked to, say, to see that, but I, I saw like, um, the Ukrainians really don't want to do join Russia. They really don't want to participate in any union with Russia anymore. Even the old people, even the people they live in the Soviet Union, like those babushkas, those old men, you know, they come and give some uh, potato or some uh, apple or something to us. Because these people, they really know what's Russian, right? What uh, Russia did in the Soviet Union for those people too. Some people, yes, they have some nostalgia, but I think most of the people they don't like, you know, because Russian they really try to kill, you know, the culture of Ukraine, the language and everything. Another example I give to you: how bad and how evil, you know, how evil is these people, man? I was talking to. Um, one of those uh, neighbors of my friend over there in Bucha, you know, neighbor of his brother, whatever. That woman, she come to us, he knows her, right? Because he used to go to his, his brother's house and everything, so he knows the neighbors over there. So, and then one of the neighbors over there in Bucha, okay? The woman, she was like a beautiful woman, you know, a young woman. She got raped by 10 guys. One, 10 guys? 10 guys. One time, 
the guys the guys come with the armor vehicle, the Russians, they come with the armor vehicle, they rape the woman. Right? Then they come second time after two weeks, they rape her in front of her husband, kill her and bury her in the in the backyard. And kill her husband too. This is the level of evil of these fucking Russians. Would you say that the use of sexual violence by Russian soldiers is common? 100%. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many thousands of Ukrainian women they get raped by these piece of shits. Those early days, what was combat against the Russian army like in those areas? For the Russians, uh, I think a good a good way to a good way to open this topic would be: Could you describe what your first engagement was like with the Russians at the start of the war? Yes, was in March of last year, mm -hmm. exactly in that region. The in Irpin, Bucha, in, that in, area. In that area, yes. With territorial defense. Territorial defense, you know, in some special forces too, because in this territorial defense they have a group of special forces. The guys was unbelievable good. Very professional. Very professional. You know, super professional. So we have engagement with these Russians over there. They used to stay in some um, woods. I don't know the name of that place exactly. But was a lot of shoot the night before, and then we have to go and take some positions over there. The Russians was very confused in that area because they really believe this was the first ones they come completely brainwashed by Russia propaganda, you know, and that kind of things. Few of those Russians also, they said to people in, in Irpin, in Bucha, uh, I don't know why, why I'm here. You know, I was uh, sleeping in the airplane and then I just wake up and I saw I was inside Ukraine. Those so people, he was asleep in the airplane, yes. then he woke up and he's like, oh, here I am. Yes, because the, the, the commanders, they lied to them too. Mm -hmm. You know, in the beginning of the war, few of those guys they really believe it. They goes for some kind of special operation or a kind of training, you know. And then they find out they uh, they just uh, they get those commanders. They, they 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 just put those guys inside Ukraine to fight against Ukrainian army. Uh, the kind of things that really happen, you know, like in in the beginning of the war. And the Russians, they get very confused, you know, especially because they don't know the, the region here, they don't know the area, they don't know the city. You know, they really believe uh, when they get here in Ukraine, you know, people's gonna just uh, throw some uh, flowers, you know. They really believe they're kind of stupidity. They believe they'd be greeted as liberators. Yes, they really believe. And it was a big surprise when the Russians start, I mean, surprise for them when they started to get killed by the people here. People really hate these people here now, more than ever. I know, of course, we have reasons for that. So, what was that first combat mission against the Russians like? Oh, uh, intense, very intense. Uh, could you tell me what it was like? Uh, describe it, unless that's like private information. I can give some examples to you, of course. You know, uh, I remember we have a situation uh, over there and. Uh, in this region of European and Bucha. Then we have uh, some group of Ukrainians uh, in the one point and we have Russians in both sides. You know. In Bucha and Irpin? Yes. In that area in the yeah, Exactly. And uh, fortunately, of course, some Ukrainians that get killed. Uh, we stay over there a couple of days. Um, even some commander after, you know, they was surprised, we still alive, you know, and the thing really bothered me, you know. And they were surprised that you guys were were still alive in Bucha and Erpin, still holding the line. Yes, exactly. And what, what when you say you were surprised, what do you, like they like, no, they were surprised, like they were they were expecting you to be dead or were they I don't know what they expect because basically we disappear, you know, for a couple of days. Oh, I think they really expect she was to be dead. So you guys like lost communication for for a while with uh, yes. command. What? Why was that? Why did you guys lose communication? Uh, I think because we don't have a properly, you know, equipment at the time. Um, no secure channel of communication. Exactly. Nobody wanted to like message them on Signal or anything like that on their phone. Like that, yeah, and. In that region, at the time, uh, cell phones isn't working good. Were they being jammed? I think so. 
The Russians used the kind of techniques since the beginning of the war. And also we received a message and uh, also a recommendation from the commander to don't use phones over there because they can listen to the conversation. Keep it on airplane mode or exactly. something Exactly. Like and uh, I have a drone. I used to fly my drone over there. And, and then they said to us also to don't use the drones because the Russians have some kind of uh, equipment. They can see where the drone uh, exactly the position then you use the drone and they can use the artillery to to kill you and the kind of things and basically we don't use any electronics i think this is the reason also we got a little lost over there but the good thing uh i mean yes it's a really bad thing but in the same time it was not too bad because we know the region you know the area i know the area very well the guys too so we managed to just leave the place escape from that trap I think this so far was the worst experience that I have because I really think uh, maybe I'm gonna die over there, you know, especially after a couple of days in that place with no communication was was a little hard. So there were, there were moments during those clashes where you, you fully believed that you could die or you would die? Yes. What? What type of clashes or what type of interactions made you think that? Was it heavy shelling? Was it close quarters uh, firefights? Uh, some close uh, quarter combats, uh, but most of the time we don't know exactly the position of the Russians because it was the main Russians in different places in that region over there. there they have a lot of forests, mm -hmm. you know, and was a lot of Russians also hiding inside the forest. Just so you have an idea, uh we find some russians here in this region in bucha Irpin, uh after basically 40 days or 60 days mm -hmm. you know. after they had already withdrawn yeah, exactly so they were just hiding in the forest they hiding in the forest and it was not just one group of russians they got uh, the uh, ukrainian army they they, they they find walkings lost in the, those forests it was a couple of those groups inside these forests they got completely lost over there for for months like two months you know and of course, you know, those Russians, they get killed because they start also, you know, um, uh, some kind of uh, sh sh try to shoot the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian army, they kill them over there. They have no choice, of course, you know, but the level of destruction in the Russian army was unbelievable, man, in that region. So from what I've been told, when the Russians kind of hit a brick wall, which was, you know, Ipin and those areas when they couldn't even, you know, get into the city itself because they never entered Kiev itself. Mm -hmm. They entered the suburbs surrounding Kiev. Did they change strategy? Did they do anything different? Or did they just keep kind of like forward march banging their head against the wall? What, what did the Russians do once they f met stiff resistance? They continue in the same plan. Just to march. Just keep marching forward. Yeah, exactly. Do you remember this big column of the forty mile convoy? Oh my God! You know everybody talking about, and even my commander, you know, at the time, you know, he said, "Oh, Alex, uh, you know, you foreigner, you know, you can still go home. You know, uh, we are Ukrainians. We need to stay here, but you foreigner, you can go home because uh, we have these big columns of." Uh, tanks they now drive to Kiev and I don't know if you know I don't know what's gonna happen I said to him no I'm here to stay man I'm gonna stay here if I say I'm gonna fight until the end I'm gonna fight until the end and this is exactly what I did but when I started to to speak with the other guys you know and some of those guys also they uh, have those kind of missions I have the kind of mission to in that region then we have like small teams and we attack the Russians like biting run, biting run, biting ambushes. run. Ambushes. A lot of ambushes. So they had this 40 mile long convoy and you guys would go somewhere along that convoy on the sides or something and yeah. you would ambush them, do damage, pull out and get out of there. Exactly. How, how would, I mean a 40 mile long convoy, they were kind of asking to get ambushed, a 40 mile long convoy in an area they hadn't fully secured. Uh, how would those ambushes regularly go? Could you maybe even describe one of the ambushes and how it went down? All right, let me um, uh, explain to you. They have a video on uh, YouTube, all right? And 
that video uh, was exactly one of the situations over there when uh, we just have guys on the side. Mm -hmm. right? I don't like to give you much details, but more or less the works like this. We have like a group of guys, you know, some numbers. I don't want to say exactly how many guys because we still use this strategy, but in other regions. Yeah, you don't want to share information. Too much information, yes. But basically it was a group of guys in both sides and attacked from one side. The Russians looked from one side and then we attacked from the other side. Mm -hmm. And it was not like many people, by the way, you know, but it was very effective at the time. And, uh, and this is the thing, when you put like a bunch of trucks, a bunch of tanks in one straight line, this is a big mistake. Mm -hmm. you, you can get destroyed pretty easy because you have just one tank they can shoot over there in the front and one in the back, basically. You know, and especially when it's very close, you know. They, uh, they don't really have much they don't anywhere have, to move. Exactly. They cannot maneuver fast. You know, it's very hard for them. So the, those Russians, they're getting confused. They have uh, um, situations then we, I saw this happening. The Russians just jump from the, 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 the tanks, jump from the, the trucks and just run inside the forest. Just abandon their equipment. Exactly. That's why in the beginning of this war, in the last year here in this region, we, uh, we took a lot of equipment because Russians just run away. And this is this happened many times. I believe that the number one contributor of armor to the Ukrainian military, people would think it was Poland or the United States. I think it might still be Russia, technically, when yeah. you actually break down how much equipment they've abandoned. Yeah, this uh, this happened also last year in Kharkiv. Last year I was in Kharkiv, and uh, you fought in Kharkiv as well. July of last year, yes. July of last year. I was with a group of uh, drone operators, you know, Ukrainian ones. Can I can I ask you? You talked about drone operating. Is that your main role? Is to operate drones or, or work with drones? Is that is that the type of work that you do? Uh, no, <laughs> believe it or not, my uh, uh, the kind of work I do it's assault. It's assault. Yes. So like a stormtrooper. Stormtrooper. Yeah. Just go and clean this. So you're the ones taking out. You're the ones attacking the forward operating positions of the Russians. Yes. You know, for example, now in the Legion, this is exactly what I'm doing. You know, I'm in the assault team. So this is uh, uh, extremely dangerous work. Yes, man, it's like really shitty work to be honest. Shitty work. Yeah, you know, you, you need to clean the shit. Clean the shit. Clean the shit. Is that a reference to to the, to the Russians? Oh, a bunch of Russians. shit. Gotcha. You. you know what I mean? Like we need just to clean the shit. This is not like a a fun work, but we have to do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. You know and. Uh, I have like um, uh, my team right now fighting some place in the east, mm -hmm. you know, and the situation there now it's not easy, you know. Uh, people have to stop in believing Russian propaganda, especially in the west, you know, because right now everybody say, oh, you know, Ukraine fell in the counteroffensive. Oh, Ukraine they go to is low. Oh, Ukraine, I don't know. Uh, listen, this is the thing, man. Uh, War is not one thing that you know by the book. You read the book and you know exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. War always change. Techniques always change. The enemy always change. Because when the enemy they starting to see, they starting to lose, they're going to change. Because if they don't change, they're going to lose 100%. And the Russians, they learn, you know, also with the Ukrainians and the Russians they change the strategy too all the time. I wanted to ask you about that because I always get a somewhat different answer when I ask about this. How have the Russians changed in their tactics? Have they learned from their lessons? They're not really doing these 40 mile long convoys anymore. Well unless they're heading towards Moscow but besides that uh, besides the Wagner group and that uh, they don't really do that anymore. Have they learned from their mistakes and have gotten more effective? Yeah, they do learn. So what happened now? Uh, I give an example to you. Uh, Ukrainians they use drones all the time. This kind of small drones, like uh, DJI drones, you know, um, and some other kind of drones that Ukrainians they use all the time. Since the beginning of the war, I use the kind of drone too in the beginning of the war, and the drone, the Ukrainians trying to adapt the drones for 
whatever situation they need for surveilling or for attack now we use like as a kamikaze drones a bunch of those kind of drones and also to launch grenades and the kind of things the russians learn they sign to do the same thing mm -hmm. so they use the kind of techniques Ukrainians they use the techniques, as I said, in the especially in the beginning of the war, you know, with uh, uh, small teams of soldiers, you know, to ambush the Russians, like 20, 30 soldiers. Now the Russians use the same techniques, but we learn with them too. So when the Russians start, you know, encircle cities like they did in Mariupol, like they did in Bahmut. They try, they, they, they try to do here also in, in, in Yerpin, in Bucha. They really try. But the Ukrainians, they trap those people here. This was, was one of the reasons that the Russians just uh, move all the equipment and, 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 and escape to Belarus because they know they're going to be trapped here. So the Ukrainians, they learn also these techniques. And you see right now in some places in, 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 in the front lines, the Ukrainians, they go and it's trying to do the same thing, you know, take on the sides and the flanks and try to encircle the Russians. So they learn with us and we learn with them too. Mm -hmm. And also that's why people in the West, they need to stop this, uh, you know, they need to stop this uh, thinking. They, they need to stop to thinking like uh, uh, the war in Ukraine is like a video game. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You go, you get a machine gun, you get like a bunch of weapons, and then we, we just storm the, the 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 enemy positions, and you kill everyone. You know, very fast. We did something like that last year in the hard Kiev, also in, in uh, 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 Kiev region. We did in Kiev, in Kiev region, we did in Kharkiv. More the Kharkiv counteroffensive. Yes, yeah, the counteroffensive. Did you participate in that? Uh, yes, I did. Because this was July of last year. It was until August or September in that region, something like that. Mm -hmm. you know, then after that, I come to Kiev again and I started to work with the humanitarian for a while. You know, especially help the soldiers, help uh, uh, civilians, you know. And then this year, uh, about two, three months ago, I joined the Legion. Mm -hmm. What was the Kharkiv counteroffensive like? Because a lot of people saw the Kharkiv counteroffensive and how quick it was, and now they've projected how you know successful that was to use that as the standard to compare every single yeah, other Yeah, this, th this is the problem. People try to compare, like, one uh, situation with the other situation. This situation we have now is completely different, right? First of all, uh, the Russians have these positions over there in Donetsk and Luhansk for years and years, since 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, they know the area, they know the people, so they know the city, they know everything over there. They got support from some idiots over there too. So it's much more hard to go and just storm those places and do this big counteroffensive. Look, this is the thing. Little by little, we break the defense lines of the Russians because the, the field of theirs. In Zaporozhye you're talking about? Zaporozhye, right? also in Donetsk, and uh, even in, in, in Lugansk region. Mm -hmm. uh, little by little, we see one advance here, a little advance there, little by little. The situation there is super fucking hard, man. Why? We have a lot of mines, just unbelievable. Uh, the numbers of uh, 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 anti-tank mines we have there the numbers of you know mines we have and all the field over there is just unbelievable we get a lot of soldiers in the russian side also in the ukrainian side you know sometimes they get just blow up by those mines we really have to be careful every single step we make there is not easy that's why you see sometimes in this uh, deep state map, like Ukrainians, they advance like 100 meters in one day, 200 meters, sometimes a kilometer. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it's super hard, you know. For example, we don't use much the armor vehicles and the tanks in this counteroffensive. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we need to demine the, the, the region first, you know, because there's so many of those mines and, and, and everywhere. And if we try to do that, you know, for sure, they, 
the, uh, the, the tanks and all the armor vehicles are going to be destroyed pretty fast. So first we need to demine the place, this is why, like little by little, you know. But people in the West really believe we need to do fast. Oh, they need to do fast. This has to happen right now. Uh, people really, you know... Uh, do, you, do you think it's people prioritizing political considerations over, you know, actual like military considerations? Or what, why do you think the motivation is to like, we need to win this like right now, like go, go, go? Uh, I think it's more like uh, media. The media? Media. Because the media, they talk so much about that counter-offensive, or we send a lot of weapons to Ukraine. They send a lot of weapons, but there's not a lot of weapons at the same time. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, those uh, Leopard tanks, how many of those we have? A hundred? This is not a lot. You have a fucking front line of 2,000 kilometers. You know, from Harrison to Kharkiv Oblast. You know, this is about 2,000 kilometers of front line. And that's if you're not including, like, Belarus and, and all these other areas. Exactly, you know, because there in the border of Belarus, they have a lot of Ukrainian soldiers too. Mm -hmm. I've been there a few times and I know what I'm talking about. I saw that. I was just a few meters from the Russian border. I, I saw like the Russian border like 300 meters from uh, where I used to go, you know. Uh, and this is the thing, man. Uh, those quantities of weapon is is not enough. Yes, uh, Poland they send I think two hundred uh, tanks, but this is some kind of Soviet tanks, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the uh, new tanks, new tanks, you know, those Leopards, whatever, you know, and uh, the Western weapons was no, 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 no many, you know, like. You're talking about what a hundred tanks, mm -hmm. like brand new, like I mean, brand new, you know, there's no brand new, it's like whatever, just um, whatever. This leopard tank, that everybody newer probably, than the Soviet tanks, yeah, newer than the Soviet tanks, yes. So, it was about a hundred or a hundred something, you know, like it's no many. The West should send it to us like a thousand of those tanks, not a hundred, a hundred something. You know, for the we don't have helicopters. We have those Soviet helicopters here still. Like MIA stuff like that. Yeah, you know, we should to have you know the decent ones, like maybe two, three hundred good helicopters. You know, like about two hundred jets. You know, like F-16 or Eurofight or Gripping, whatever it is. You know what I mean? We should to have that kind of things, like in numbers. Mm -hmm. No, just give a little and give a little bit more. In a little bit more. Drip, 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 drip. No, this is ridiculous. You know. Do you do you blame the West for for taking too long to send more equipment? Because we always like every few months there's like a new thing that used to be untouchable. Like tanks used to be like no, we can't send tanks. Then Look. they send tanks, and then it was the long range missiles, then the storm shadows, and then it was the jets, and now the F-16s. Do you do you? Uh, at all, like blame Western allies for like taking so long that you know there could have been more progress if, if they were quicker in their response. Look, I don't blame the people of mm -hmm. those countries. I don't blame the British people. I don't blame the American people. I don't blame the um, or Italians or Spanish or Portuguese. I don't blame the people from those countries. I blame the government of those countries because the government of those countries is just a bunch of fucking competence like bureaucrats you know mm -hmm. then just take so fucking long to do something people here for example in poland people was more fast and also i see poland they really push the rest of the nato countries to do something bigger and faster and sometimes i see um, nato also stop you know, uh, Poland to help Ukraine in some other ways. Mm -hmm. Early on, that was the MiGs, where the Poles wanted to transfer MiGs over to the Ukrainians in trade for F-16s and the Biden administration. Didn't uh, exactly. That. Do you think there's a disconnect between, like, Poles, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, the people who are closer to the Russian border? A hundred percent, man. Uh, and, say, the French or the Germans? A hundred percent. Can can you describe that, that separation a little bit, that divide? Uh, First of all, people in this uh, region over here in the east of Europe, you know, 
is more tough people because they have a lot of conflict, especially with Russia. Uh, who suffered the most in the World War II, you know, besides the Germans, uh, was, uh, and also um, Poland, was also those small countries like Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, uh, Ukraine, you know, a lot of Ukrainian people that get killed in the World War II, you know. Mm -hmm. So these people here, they know, you know, like uh, what's Russia, what's Soviet, what Russian can do again for those countries. That's why these people in this region are here still like, like strong people. Uh, and also they want to support Ukraine even more because they know if they don't do the kind of support, they're going to be the next, 100%. Mm -hmm. And uh, Poland, they know that. And all the mess the Russians they made here in Ukraine also they affect those countries because it's not easy when you just one day to the next you have to open your borders for like millions of refugees like Poland indeed you know Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia this is small countries right mm -hmm. you know and they have like hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian refugees in those countries you know some of those countries have how many people three million people four million people or something like that imagine like in, in just in the next day you have 10% more people in your country. You have like 400,000, 500,000, a million people over there. Uh, I think uh, Poland have, I don't know, maybe 3 million Ukrainians over there. It's a lot of people, mm -hmm. you know? So they know if they don't do something right now to help Ukraine, for sure, they're gonna have the same problem in the future. If you're Russian right now, they win this, this war in some stupid way, for example, if West once again, they push Ukraine to sign any bullshit agreement like they did and, uh, in the 90s, like they did uh, in the 2014, you know, Russia for sure is going to get strong once again in 10 years, then they're going to invade Ukraine, take the rest of the, rest of the country. <laughs> 20 years from now, you're going to see Russia so powerful, they're going to take the rest of Europe, 100%. You think that if the the Russians are not stopped now in Ukraine, that they're going to attempt to take the rest of Europe? hundred percent not. They're never going to stop. What here. would you say to someone who says, like, you know, the Russians haven't really performed relatively as well as most people would have judged them to. Many people thought they were the second most powerful military in the world, and they seem to be running into a lot of trouble. It's hard for a lot of people to imagine them, after this, somehow going on and trying to conquer other countries. Yeah. You know, like, um, if the Russians don't get stopped here now, inside mm -hmm. Ukraine, right? Those people in the west of Europe, mm -hmm. 10, 15, 20 years from now, the most 20 years, I think even less, they're going to see the Russians just knock the doors over there. And I don't think those people in those countries are going to stop Russians like Ukrainians do right now. I don't think those people there they have I don't want to say they don't have the balls to do maybe they do but uh, the life in the West I think is too comfortable people there they have too soft maybe too soft uh, they have like some different mentality different problems you know what I mean like sometimes I see on the internet like some videos of some people there they fight just because someone parking the parking spot that they don't belong to them or someone they fight in the supermarket about some bullshit like some stupid things the people in the West they fight for mm. here we fight for the real shit for survive for the country for the kids for the women you know so this is a real fight have you uh, fought in Zaporozhye before, in that area? No, not yet. Gotcha. Where, where in the east have you fought? You said you fought in Kharkiv? Uh, this is more north of Kharkiv. Now we fight in Donetsk. Uh, you, you fought in Donetsk? Yes. Uh, around Bakhmut or around areas near you, Bakhmut? Yeah, we fight over there now. This is new for me because this is the first time then I go to those regions. So you've, so you've recently came back from that combat? Yeah, I can come back from the, the, the region over there. What is the fighting like over there? Because it's very different than what it was like in the early days in Kiev. A lot of trench warfare, 
a lot of um, you know very heavily entrenched positions. Uh, not a lot of quick movement in Donetsk. Could you describe what the fighting is like over yeah. there? Just let me clarify one thing here, okay? Sure. Just, okay, because you asked me before, and I was thinking uh, why the West have to give weapons to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm gonna clarify this for people to understand. Sure. Right? In the 90s, when Ukraine have the agreement with the uh, U.S. and I think um, U.K. and Russia, Budapest Memorandum. Yeah, this Budapest Memorandum. People really think it was just the nuclear weapons, but it was not just the nuclear weapons. It was missiles, airplanes, tanks, helicopters was a bunch of weapons then also Ukraine basically have to destroy and they did for example we have these bombers that the Russians use in the Caspian Sea right now to bomb Ukraine with the missiles that Ukraine, the Ukrainians give to the Russians at the time mm. because you, when Ukraine in the 90s they signed this Budapest Memorandum, but was not just the nuclear weapons, was a lot of long-range missiles too. Right? More than a thousand of those missiles. And many of those missiles right now, the Russians use against us. So that's why it's not fair when the West just give a little bit here, a little bit there, and a little bit over there. Let me ask you one thing here. How much do you think is the cost to make a nuclear program. Oh gosh, I would, I would imagine it's quite expensive. Uh, it's like hundreds of billions of dollars, yeah, it's yes? Really expensive. At least. How much is to make a program to make a very sophisticated uh, uh, bomber, you know, those big airplanes? Uh, well, from knowing from uh, how much it is for the American Pentagon and, and these contracts, it can be and go up into the billions upon billions upon billions of dollars. Yeah, so Ukraine just, you know, give all those things to those people, basically. They give the nuclear program because they give all the nuclear weapons. They give all the, the kind of airplanes that you cannot produce anymore. They give all the tanks, all the helicopters. So how much this cost? So this is the question that people have to ask, you know, the governments in the West. Mm -hmm. Okay, when you give like a few billions here, a few billions there, this is enough. You know, if it was not this kind of bad agreement, probably we don't have war in this country. Mm -hmm. If you have the kind of weapons... You don't think that the Russians would have invaded if they kept their, their Soviet-era weapons? 100% or not. You know, and I don't talk about the nuclear weapons. I talk just about the other regular weapons. Then you know the West forced Ukraine to give mm -hmm. or destroy. You know, you people can just do a research on Google. They're gonna see that you know those bombers and they have videos from the 90s. You know, like even the pilots of those airplanes here in Ukraine, they cry when they see that. They say this is just unbelievable. This is like a uh, then we're gonna, never going to make the kind of things again. Never going to have this kind of technology again. And you can see, like, uh, in, in, in the, I saw those videos on YouTube, like those old videos from the 90s, mm -hmm. you know, and I saw, like, those pilots, they really cry. They say, oh, my God, so this is just unbelievable. You guys just destroy all these airplanes. It was more than 30 of those big bombers then, you know, West forced Ukraine to destroy. So that's why, you know, West have to give more and more to Ukraine and help the people here and finish this war, okay, because they can finish any time, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if they send more weapons to Ukraine or if they send the fucking NATO troops here to finish this shit, we can finish this in one week. When it's pro -pro propagandists, pro Russians, yeah. yes. Pro-Russia pro in the West is trying to speak about ah, NATO's in the war. NATO's not in the war. You haven't seen any NATO super soldiers out in the field? Hey, Are you a NATO super soldier? Oh, I wish. You know, like, uh, and, and this is the thing. What kind of weapons we have here from NATO? Like 20, 30 high Mars? How many high Mars you United States have? How many hundreds of high Mars you United States have? And plus the other countries in in NATO. How many 
you know, of those F-16s or F-35, 22, whatever it is. How many of those airplanes, you know, the West have, NATO have, thousands. How many we have here? Zero. You know, how many of those tanks like Challenger, Abrams, or, you know, uh, Leopard, whatever it is. How many did the West have? Thousands. How many we have here? A hundred? Sometimes I hear from critics of Ukraine's, uh, you know, aid to Ukraine, they'll say, well, if we send this or send that, you know, it could escalate the war. Okay. What do you think about those types of concerns? I think it's just a political game. And it's completely bullshit. And this is what I think. Russia never going to stop if we don't stop Russia. Look, they have one kind of people they just understand one kind of language the language of force power and violence sometimes with against those people because those people they use violence against uh, civilians innocent people like the terrorists in the middle east you know those terrorist groups what kind of language those people understand you just understand one kind of language, the language of power. When someone go there and bomb them up and fuck them up and kill them. This is the only language some people understand. And Putin, he just understand one kind of language. When you try to be soft and talk to him in the political way, okay? When you try to be dipl diplomatic with Russians, just doesn't work, man doesn't work you need to show these people you have the balls and you're gonna fuck them up too then they starting to believe if the West is stopping play that kind of game to give one little drop here another little drop there okay give a few high mars here few tanks right here if they stop this bullshit and really give all the weapons then Ukraine really need speak with Putin first and listen man we're gonna send a bunch of fucking weapons over there if you don't just get out of the country. We give a chance to you. Right now. Invent some fucking shitty. Ah, I win the uh, military, the, 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 how they call this, uh, special military operation. Special military operations. Yeah, like the we, yeah, okay. We are the winners or whatever. Just say something you fucking Like, we, not, we did not survive. We killed all the Nazis. Exactly. You know, like, invent something. If you have... You have few days to. I do, I do want to ask because people talk about an off ramp. You know how to how do the giving Putin an off ramp, giving him an opportunity to leave. Is there any type of concession that you think the Ukrainians should give them in order for Putin to kind of take that to his people and say, "Look, we won something," so so he feels that it's politically um, uh, expedient or at least politically possible for him to do it, or no, we shouldn't give any concession. We try to speak with these people in the beginning of the war. Mm -hmm. All right. If you just check the records of last year, we really tried to speak with them last year, few times. We have those kind of meetings with them in Belarus, I think maybe two or three times. We really tried to speak with them, especially in the first days of war. They say, no, no, you don't want to speak about that. We're going to continue and take the country. This is exactly what they said. And after a few months, they realize, you know, the war doesn't want to be exactly the way they, they expect to be fast, mm -hmm. you know. And now you can have to go to the end, just take the territories. It's, I think the, 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 the time to talk, you know, is it's over. It's over. It's no talk anymore. As soon as we start to invade my territory, kill my people, you know, I mean, kill the people here in Ukraine, destroy all the cities, you know, bomb all this civilian infrastructure like last year when they sent a lot of people here to to the darkness because we don't have electricity in big cities like Kiev for days we don't have water for many days in the middle of the winter okay the talk's over you really try to commit a genocide inside this country and we don't want to allow that you would say that because the russians did that at least most analysts believe this is the case obviously i can't read putin's mind but most analysts seem to say that the idea was that they were going to intensify <coughs> intensify the suffering during the winter, cut out the electricity, make the civilians feel the war, and then the civilians might pressure the Ukrainian government to cave or to concede more. Do you think it had the opposite effect in, in strengthening their resolve? 100%. 
a hundred percent because people here they know that they know if they put the head down for Russians and they let the Russians do whatever they want we don't want to have a country anymore people here are never gonna be free anymore people is gonna live like in Russia Russia you cannot say anything against the government because you go to prison people try to protest in the streets with just a piece of you know white paper like that nothing writing the white paper it's just you I've know, seen those videos you saw those videos I think most of the people saw those videos the people get arrested for that thing I want to ask you because Sometimes you'll hear from certain American commentators, primarily people like Tucker Carlson. I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, that American political figure, mm -hmm. but they'll try to say, "Well, actually, Ukraine's a dictatorship too. You can't criticize the government, or you'll go to prison there as well." Uh, is that the case, or or is that just one hundred percent not? So you can criticize the government here. Yeah. Is there any criticisms you would offer of the government here? Oh, what I can say about this. Sometimes the soldiers, you know, it's not happy with some politicians here in mm -hmm. this country, you know, like some politicians, they play some stupid games sometimes, uh, like uh, they did last year, they lower the, uh, they tried to lower the salary of the soldiers and in the they same... They tried to lower the salary of the soldiers. Yeah, the and, and in the same time, yeah, you know, try to rise their own salaries and people get really upset about that. You know, so I can criticize the. At least I don't like politicians. I think it's just a bunch of fucking criminals. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bunch of fucking mafia shit. You don't like politicians? No, very much. in any country. You know, in, even here in Ukraine, mm -hmm. I know they have some of those politicians, like pretty decent guys. I met a couple of those. Mm -hmm. You know, guys here in the parliament. Like I know, uh, not just a couple, but I know a few of them, like decent guys. Uh, for example, one of them was in Bahamut last year with uh, soldiers over there with a weapon, everything, basically every single day. You see? Mm -hmm. so it's not like all the politicians is bad, but most is bad, a hundred percent. Even in Ukraine? Even in Ukraine, a hundred percent. I don't trust in in, in the in the poli uh, in any politicians in any country. Mm -hmm. You know, like. Uh, I, I cannot say a hundred percent of them, but most of them is just a piece of garbage. This is what I believe, you know, about the president of this country. So think, you mean? Yeah, Zelensky. I think he's a good guy, you know, I really believe he's a good guy. I think he's really tried to fight against uh, all the shitty from Russia. What, 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 when I say all this shit from Russia, it's because uh, before the war and, all, and now also during the war was a bunch of people, you know, involved and, uh, and um, how can you say this, um, involved in, not directly in the government, but was some politicians, there was pro, there were pro-Russians, other politicians, uh, and also businessmen here in the country, some of them was super corrupt, with some uh, politicians also, and they were super corrupt. You know, cor and, and the corruption is a major issue. Yes, you know, and a uh, few of them was pro-Russians. I, I really believe you still have the kind of people inside the government here. You think there's still people in the Ukrainian Rada who are sympathetic to the... A hundred percent, you know, a hundred percent, I think, you know, and of course, sometimes it's hard to identify those people, you know, it's not easy to identify those people. They keep it quiet? They keep it quiet, and they give information to the other side, it's a hundred percent. But, you know, we have a good special service here in this country, you know, and the secret service here, that works pretty well, you know. I really believe, like, as I said, Zelensky is a good guy, but sometimes, I don't know if he closed his eye for some shitties that happen, you know, with some people, you know, mm -hmm. and I really don't like. You mean, like, think, like he's not, sometimes he's not as watchful as he could be? Uh, I think sometimes he's just um, don't get, like, 100% informed, except what's going on with some people here. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes he just, you know, get too close to some people, then he really don't want to just uh, fire those people. I don't know. This is my 
this is my impression. This is my your personal feeling, opinion. My personal opinion, you know, like this is what I think sometimes because I can feel that, mm -hmm. you know. So you see, I criticize the government here. So uh, let's see if I get arrested or not. We'll see. Okay, I can hear their footsteps. They're coming right now. Yeah. Uh, I want to bring it back to the the combat that was happening in the east of the country because you said you fought in Donetsk and the and depending on which region you're fighting and the combat can be very different. What is the fighting like in the Donbass? Because the Russians very much want to capture the Donbass. Uh, they're on the they seem to be preparing to be uh, heavily on the offensive again in Luhansk towards in the Kharkiv direction. What was the combat like in Donetsk? Um, this Russia is well prepared over there. Better prepared than they were in Kiev. Yes, because they learn in this one year and a half. They really learn. And plus, these Russians, they have this uh, line of defenses in those regions for a long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fight over there is completely different, especially because it's many of those places when we fight now is open field. In the uh, uh, Kiev region, in Kharkiv too, was more like urban. You know, it was a lot of cities and villages, you know, but in those regions over there is a lot of open fields. Sometimes, of course, we have villages. In Donetsk? Yes, Donetsk and, and uh, Luhansk also, you know. Even in Zaporizhia, I think, I, you know, I speak with people there, it's basically the same thing. Because this part of Ukraine is like... Um, it's fields, and it's fields, so much farmland. So much farmlands and everything is hard. And the Russians, they have this... Um, uh, lines of trees in many different places and the Russians they really hide over there in these uh, lines of trees and now it's super hard. A lot hard. of areas the trees are the only cover you have. Exactly and, now, and, and it's very hard to identify sometimes because there's a lot of vegetation especially this time of the year mm -hmm. in the summer everything gets green and they have a lot of leaves and everything in the winter is more easy to identify but now in the summer is much more harder to fight against these people there. Would you say the combat in Donetsk or when you were there, was it extremely intense combat? Were you working in assault operations there as well? Uh, yeah, I work with some people there, okay. My guys is over there right now. Mm -hmm. you know? International Legion? International actually? Legion. Those is the guys that really fight over there, mm -hmm. you know. In the last uh, few weeks, I just did the logistic, you know, like bring supplies and everything to those people, you know, and we get close to the front lines. Uh, those guys are in the front line right now, you know, I speak with them basically every single day and they give me a lot of information what's going on there, mm -hmm. you know, so because I'm kind of new and uh, in this in, battle. In the Legion. In you the mean, Legion, yes. You've been here for, you've been with the Legion for about two months, Two right? months, yes. Yeah. And uh, I still have to go to some uh, operation with those people there. But I choose to stay in the logistics for now. Working in logistics for now? Logistics for now, because I have a lot of contacts with a lot of NGOs, a lot of people. I have my own YouTube channel, you know, and then i asking uh, people in my channel also for donation, you know, and people help. Brazilian people, by the way, in Portuguese people, people don't speak in Portuguese in general, not just Brazilians, but... All the people they speak Portuguese or understand Portuguese, so I um, asking also those people to uh, help us here. And so far, people really help, you know. And uh, I just get basically everything, and I bring it to the guys over there. So I have you know a couple of cars. Then I just load those cars and give whatever the guys need. So, so your experience in Donetsk has mostly been a logistical role. For now, yes. Yes. While while in Kharkiv and Kiev, you were working in a more assault. Role. Yes. Uh, what what have what have they described to you when they talk about the fighting in Donetsk? What do the soldiers tell you about it? What what how do they describe the intensity of the combat there? It's very intense, very intense. Why? Because the Russians very close to them. They have some positions over there. Then I was talking to, you know, a couple of, you know, of my guys uh, just a few days ago, about three days ago or something. And they explained me, you know, the positions that we stay now is just 150 meters from the Russians. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes in the, in the night you can hear the Russians even talk. You can hear them talking? Yes. 
and uh, maybe people think oh how this is possible why you don't kill them it's not that easy especially when we stay inside those holes and everything yeah we use artillery but they use the artillery back too you know and it's not so easy like people think you know uh what people think like when you use the artillery and we hit it right away you know and this is the thing when you use the artillery you know to hit the positions you expose your artillery so that's why you cannot use the thing for nothing you use you have to use just for specific things and you have to be very precise and you have to a lot move. of shoot and scoot tactics from what i've heard yes and you really have to move after that because otherwise your artillery can be destroyed so that's why we use in very specific cases it's not like whatever we want to use you know you hear a lot of comparisons when you talk about definitely in the donbass to like world war one style trench warfare and stuff like that mm -hmm. obviously there are aspects that are different there were no drones in, in world war one but when that comparison is made do you think obviously it's not a one-to-one -one comparison but do you think there's any credibility to that comparison at all a hundred percent a hundred percent because when we stay there in those trenches uh normally we have to storm the russian positions all right so we have to capture the positions in the positions i mean like they make these lines of defense the lines of defense is trenches after trenches after trenches okay mm -hmm. and we have to uh get one by one and to do this one by one we have to go there with the infantry we have to go with uh, assault teams basically it's the same thing we saw like more than 100 years ago you really have to go there and you have to finish the job over there of course we use the drones we use artillery we use a different of other techniques but in the end they have to be soldier uh, the soldiers have to go in that position to take the position I just got back from Kharkiv and I interviewed Kraken while I was up there. Uh, I, Kraken, you know, is very have a really big presence in Kharkiv. Mm -hmm. They were heavily involved in the Kharkiv counteroffensive. Uh, why do you think the Kharkiv counteroffensive was as successful as it was as somebody who participated in it? Uh, caught Russians by surprise. I think this was the main thing because uh, we try to do something in the south and the Russians have Kherson city and Kherson city um, is the city in the west part of the river mm -hmm. and the Russians was in those positions over there and if we cut the supplies like we did destroy the bridge so that's it they're gonna be trapped over there and we can start to concentrate more forces and more power in that region and the russians really believe we're gonna attack them just in that position mm -hmm. but in the end we attack them from the north they send many troops also you know there to the south mm -hmm. then we counterattack in the north and that's why we take the position in the, that oblast uh, more fast how is described to me is that a lot of times, you know, the advance was so quick, you didn't have a lot of time to rest. There wasn't, you know, not a lot of time to sleep. It was somewhat chaotic due to how quickly a lot of the movement was happening. Um, how, uh, how was that movement? Was it, was it like, when you were moving and, and, and advancing in that area, uh, were, the, were the Russians just unable to, were they unaware of how quick you guys were moving? Like, they would find you guys and they'd be like, oh my gosh, I didn't know you guys were here yet. And they were just surprised, like, every step of the way at how fast the advance was yes uh, in some cases we took like a 20 30 kilometers per day the russians started just to abandon everything it was a collapse of russian army at the time they really run away they leave everything behind tanks artillery you guys capture a lot of equipment a lot of equipment a lot what type of equipment did you guys capture firsthand uh tanks uh artillery those big pieces of artillery it's a bunch of different weapons um rpgs basically everything the russians have what was it that they just didn't have enough time to take it with them they don't have any time they really collapsed it was just unbelievable how the things over there really collapsed for them you know like 
that they really don't expect that kind of things. And that's why people today, they really think we have to do it in the same way. But it doesn't work like that. But as I said in the beginning, uh, the enemy also, they change the strategy. So it's not easy, you know, to do the same thing we did like a few months ago. Of course, we try to find the weak spot. As soon as we find the weak spot, yes, probably we can do much more faster. And not just find the weak spot, but when we break some lines of defense, because Russians now they have very strong lines of defense. When we break that, that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's a lot like I think it's about three big lines of defense, but the first one is the hardest one because they put basically everything right now in this uh, in these lines of defense. Oh, you mean across the whole front line or Zaporozhye specifically? This is Zaporozhye specifically, you know, but uh, they have other places too. Like right now the Russians concentrate 100,000 troops in uh, Luhansk Yeah, in the region. direction of Park, it was 100,000 troops. 900 tanks and 555 yeah guns. but this is not new man this is there since last year since the winter because the russians i don't know if people remember that the russians also make this big propaganda said oh you know we go for a counteroffensive in the winter and we're gonna take the rest of ukraine mm -hmm. so nothing happened in the winter the same people basically well they, they did attack during there. the winter though huh? they did keep attacking during the winter they just didn't capture a lot of territory. No, it's just it's small pieces here, it's small pieces over there, as far as in Bahamut. Why would they, you know, they really committed to these attacks during the winter. I mean, like, continuous attacks. Why do you think they weren't able to capture that much territory? Uh, I think it's because Ukrainian, they got to really prepare for them. You know, the Ukrainian army, they really got prepared. You know, we, as I said, we learn a lot, too. They learn, we learn, and that's why they cannot capture any big piece of territory, because we fight in all those regions over there, and also we have strong lines of defenses in, across the, the front. So that's one of the big reasons, pretty hard also to break our lines of defense. But the Russians are going to try, no matter what, especially get those um, regions in uh, Luhansk, you know, and uh, I mean, uh, Bahmud, Severodonetsk, no, Severodonetsk, uh, uh, Kramatorsk, Slavyansk. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've been to Kramatorsk, the place is a fortress. Yes. But you know what I find out? I speak with a lot of Ukrainians. So, mm -hmm. and Ukrainian people, it's very well informed. You know why the Russians really try to capture that region? Why is that? Because in two, three years ago, I think, you know, uh, was discovered like a, a big reserve of lithium over there. Lithium? Yes. You think the Russians want to capture the Donbass for lithium reserves? For lithium reserves. What do you think the Russians' interest, because people, everybody has a different interpretation, but depending upon what you think their interests are, how you should approach the war is different. Why do you think the Russians invaded? Do you think it was nationalism? Do you think it was, they wanted resources? Uh, do you think it at all had to do with this idea that they pushed about, you know, NATO expansion? Do you think it's a combination of these factors? Okay, this is the thing. Uh, when a human being have so much power like Putin and his mafia people have, mm -hmm. they're really starting to believe they can do anything. They are super powerful, invincible. Believe their own hype? Yes, they really believe. And Putin was one of those guys that really believe he can be... He said that on video. He said, oh, I consider myself like Peter the Great. You know? I do remember that interview, yeah. So, the guy is imperialist. It's so funny because those uh, socialists, communists, whatever, they say, oh, America is very imperialist. No, those Russians is more imperialist than anyone. Putin, he said that on TV. He said, oh, you know, we have to capture all this uh, land of Russia once again. We have to reconquer again. 
that means like Poland, all this region here, Poland, and even to Lisbon or some shit like that. The guy is completely paranoid and completely crazy. But it was a combination of many things here. Okay, first of all, these people really believe they are so powerful. Okay, I'm invincible because I have 6,000 nuclear weapons, nobody, for sure nobody's gonna fight against us. If we invade all these countries here, we can take everything because we can threat everyone with the nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. This is one thing. Second of all, this is a mafia people, they work for themselves inside Russia and these people have so much money but they want even more money and even more power. Mm -hmm. right? They know in Ukraine they have a lot of natural resources like you know, gas, oil, lithium and a bunch of other things. So they really want to take this country here, plus take the population of Ukraine. Can, can I ask, do you think the United States and its motivations to support Ukraine is also based somewhat in like, we want access to those resources too, lithium, oil, natural gas, do you think those, those motivations came into supporting Ukraine? I think people, uh, so people fight for one, one reason, like the Russians fight to get all the resources and also the Ukrainian people, right? You said people fight for one reason? or multiple I mean, reasons for multiple reasons mm -hmm. okay let's put it this way uh but especially for power and money mm -hmm. right and also in the other side like united states and nato and blah 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 you know of course the people that have their own you know goals mm -hmm. you know and uh, but it's different in russia what i mean different russia go in one place sucks everything like a leech mm -hmm. and after that people in that in those countries or whatever they get in the poverty get like shit like in Syria right now those Russians inside Syria what Russia bring to Syria mostly Not bombed hospitals bombed hospitals and that's it okay Americans were also in Afghanistan Mm -hmm. I, I, I was in Afghanistan. I saw what you, happened in Afghanistan. Did you work in Afghanistan as a private military contractor? Yes. For the United States? For some company. For some company? Yeah. I, I assumedly working with the United States though, right? Some company. Or gotcha. Right? Yeah. But this is the thing. Uh, I saw what the Americans did in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I, they bring schools, roads, you know, they bring more freedom to people. This is the truth. Mm -hmm. People cannot, maybe people don't believe that, but I saw that. I saw women walking the street. I saw women over there with this um, whole vest. I don't remember the name of this. Um, uh, the burqa? Burqa, yes. So uh, I saw people, uh, the women's dress with burqas, you know, the, like head to toe in the streets over there. But also I saw women just with a little, you know, thing in the, 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 in the head uh, and nothing else with uh, jeans. And walk in the streets mm -hmm. of Kabul. Now, if you go back there again, what are you gonna see there? Huh? The women also in Afghanistan, they used to go to the college, used to go to the school when the Americans were in, inside Afghanistan. If you go back there now, what happened with those women? They have to stay inside the home and never go to the school again, never have education again. So in some level, yes, they have, they bring some a uh, level of freedom, some bring some um, they bring some level of uh, education, infrastructure, you know. But what about Russia? Russia just bombed Syria, destroy the whole country. They go to Africa, take everything from the African people over there with this fucking Wagner group through the shell companies and the, and the gold mines and stuff like that. Yeah, what they do over there? Just suck like leeches, you know. But when the Americans go to one country, after some time, the country become better. You just see over there in Latin America. I think it was in uh, Panama or Nicaragua. Was one one of those countries over there after the some war we have in the eighties against uh, United States. Some kind of war. Or yeah, Panama invasion. You're talking yeah, about yeah, something like that. Look, Panama right now is one of the best countries in Latin America. This is what I'm talking about. I do want to ask because, you know, uh, I had a lot of family who served in Afghanistan. Um, you know, I know a lot of people who went over to Afghanistan. And something I hear a lot from them is they just didn't want us there. That a lot of the people there, you know, they were not very receptive to our presence. 
um, definitely due to certain like uh, you know airstrikes and and you know local customs and many people viewed the United States as an occupier, very similar similar to how you know, the Soviets were viewed when they came to Afghanistan. If the United States is bringing all these positive things to Afghanistan, I know this is somewhat off topic, but I am interested in your opinion here. Um, why do you think? there wasn't more manifested support in society. There were people who were scared to see the Americans go because they'd lose their education, opportunities, stuff like that. Why, why do you think that support didn't manifest as somebody who was in Afghanistan as a PMC contractor? Um, of course, they have uh, uh, a foreigner, you know, uh, force inside your country is not a nice thing to see. Mm -hmm. You know, you see tanks in your street is not a nice thing to see. You know, when you have also the other side to make a propaganda, you know, people can believe in those things too. Um, doesn't matter if the people coming from liberation or not, but it's not nice to see like some foreigner force inside your country. I think people really don't like to see the kind of things. But this is the thing. If you asking today, mm -hmm. the people there, I guarantee to you, was better with the Americans or not with the Taliban? So this is the question that we need to ask for the people who are now. I have friends inside the Afghanistan. Still in Afghanistan? Yeah, Afghan guy. You know, with his family. He's still there. He said, man, the fucking thing here did change a lot. You know, it was much better when the Americans were here in, in Afghanistan. And now we don't have any freedom here. Anyone can get killed here, can get arrested here. This is the thing. You appreciate things sometimes in life just when you lose. Mm -hmm. And was bad with the Americans? Yes, but now it's much worse. You know, we, we were in Afghanistan for a good, I think, what, like 20, 21 years. Um, when the war in Afghanistan started, I was probably like four months old. And uh, it was it was going on for the entirety of my life. There there was a possibility that there were people who were born mm -hmm. before the war started and then started serving in the war. We were there for a very long time. With all the billions upon but actually I think it was over a trillion. Yeah. Um, with all the money invested in the Bush administration to the Obama administration to the Trump and then eventually the Biden administration, so much investment, so many times, so many different strategies that all these governments used. Why? Was there no success in establishing a stable government that the locals trusted? The locals seemed to view the government as, as corrupt, and there was a lot of corruption in Afghanistan. There was a lot of problems. Why, even though we, we poured so much resources, did the government not succeed? Did Ashraf Ghani flee the country with reportedly like bags of money, according to some reports? He denies that, of course. Why, why, why so little success uh, in the American mission to build a stable democracy in Afghanistan? Uh, I think it's because the people in Afghanistan, they're getting used to living in that kind of situation for a long time. And to break this is super hard. They take not just one generation sometimes. Sometimes it takes two, three generations, what, 40 years, 60 years to change the whole system, to change the whole mentality of people. Look here in Ukraine. You still have some old people here. They really believe the Soviet Union was better than now. You know, in Soviet Union, you cannot, um, you don't have, a, in, in, at the time, we don't have any freedom, basically, here in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, we have lim limited resources here. I mean, like, even a pair of jeans was forbidden to buy here in this country, in the Soviet Union time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, but we still have some people, you know, then really believe it. That time was better than today, you know. And the same thing with people applies with people in Afghanistan. Uh, the people that are living that kind of rough regime, like so oppressed, you know, like and really uh, the, a bunch of dictators in the power, you know, like for so long, then people getting used to live like that, you know. And when you see something different, and they start really to change your life, sometimes it's not too comfortable for people, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, Do you think it was too much, too fast? I think it was necessary, especially for the West, because the country was a, just a host a lot of terrorists. When you think the war was necessary? The war was necessary, because mm -hmm. we need to stop those people. There was a bunch of mm, terrorists everywhere in the country. 
Imagine it today, after 20 years, if you never stop the kind of people, you know, with let Osama bin Laden, all those people there, do whatever they want, train a bunch of people. Imagine it today. Those terrorists from Afghanistan join Russia right now. Mm -hmm. You know, in Russia, send Wagner group of there, send a bunch of Russians of there to training a bunch of techniques and a bunch of I don't know what, and recruit a bunch of people there for for peanuts to fight here in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine it is today? I've heard reports of actually uh, former ANA soldiers, people who served with the Afghan National Army, serving with the Russians and PMCs. Uh, after you know the Taliban took over yeah. the country, they left and joined with the Russians. Is there any credibility to those reports? Oh, that's true. Well, well, how does that make you feel? Probably as somebody who, you know, working with PMCs, probably worked with these people, worked with the ANA. Um, now, basically, man, to work as a PMC, I'm never gonna work as a PMC. Yeah, yeah, this is the thing. You're never gonna do PMC work again. No. Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to say never, but it depends. The the, depends the people, depends the place. I, you know, uh, people offer me a job right now, but this is a British people. With British people, yes, I can work as a PMC. With American companies, yes, I can work as a PMC. But for, with a Asian uh, companies, no, I cannot work with those people at all. Because I know if I work with Americans, it's going to be Americans or some Europeans. Mm -hmm. If I work with the British, it's going to be, you know, the British people and some other Europeans. Mm -hmm. And people, they, it's going to be very well select. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But if I work with Asians in any PMC company, probably it's going to be a bunch of Russians or a bunch of, I don't know who. So I cannot work with these people. You don't want to work with, with Asian private military companies? No. Why not? Why? Just because of the proximity to Russia? or? Yes, exactly. Not sure. Yeah, especially it's, as I said, for sure it's going to be a, some Russians in the company too, and I fight here in this country. I call him my face you now, but people, they know me for sure. Back to my question about the ANA though, I assume when you were doing that work in Afghanistan, you had to work with ANA soldiers on, on some occasions? learning that some of those people that you were I assumedly either working with or helping in some capacity, obviously I probably do, can't know the specifics, knowing that some of them went to Russia and then joined the invasion of Ukraine to fight against a democracy when they were supposedly supposed to be defending an Afghan democracy or building one, does that make you feel any way? Does that, does that, you, do you reflect on that at all, like how that could have happened? Like, what, what were the interests of those people? One thing I can say about this, sometimes I speak with my people there in my, in my channel exactly about this. Mm -hmm. right? I spoke a few times about exactly what you ask me right now. Uh, were people and people. I don't know if I understand. Sorry, could you say that again? Were people and people. Like, you have people and you have another kind of people. Okay. To make more clear. Mm -hmm. right? So we have one kind of people and you have another kind of people. So there were like good ANA guys that like, those are good good guys and then there were people who were in it for different reasons? No. It's, uh, okay, let me explain better to you. Right? When Russia invaded Ukraine, mm -hmm. Zelensky, what he said to the West, I don't need a ride. I need weapons, ammunition to fight. This is exactly what he said, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. What the president of Afghanistan he did when the war started? He just packed his shit. Ashraf Ghani, you mean? Yeah. Yes, put everything in his suitcase, all the fucking money, you know, all this cash, leave the country and don't give a shit about his people. So, this is what I'm talking about. We have people and we have people. Afghan army was about 300,000 guys. Mm -hmm. 300,000 is a lot. Is that on paper or in reality? Okay, let's put, let's put in the reality. If it was half, man, like mm -hmm. 150,000. Gotcha. All right? Mm -hmm. The Taliban was just 70,000, half. All right? Mm -hmm. If we put like no 300,000, 150,000, 7,000, half of uh, this Afghan army. In the Afghan army, they have more weapons, they have the support from the West if they decide to fight. 
and the president leave the country, but they still have commanders, you have generals, you have the army commanders, and what's going on with that people? Why the Afghan people don't fight if they have the chance to fight against the Taliban and finish this shit once and for all? Mm -hmm. You know, saying, oh, wait, we have more weapons, we have the support from the West, fuck this president, he's a coward, let's put some somebody else in his place or some general we speak with the general or the general come in on tv say okay let's fight mm -hmm. but no they decided just to do nothing put the weapons down taliban took everything and nobody fight what kind of man we have there huh what kind of patriot you have there uh, the people really think about the country, they think about their own families, they think about their wife, the kids or something, or these people don't think about anything, they just think about, I don't know what. Personal safety? Per personal safety. So why do you think some of those ANA guys went and worked with the Russians? For money. Money. So you don't think a lot of the ANA guys were in it for, you know, necessarily the most altruistic reasons the most good reasons no for just money the foreigners they fight here in ukraine mm -hmm. is for ideology mm -hmm. would you consider yourself you know here fighting for ideology 100 percent for freedom mm -hmm. for the right thing for my family mm -hmm. for my friends you know, for a good people of this country, you know, and the same thing with the other foreigners that come to fight here. We fight for a hundred percent for freedom of the free world, because if you rush and take this country, next country, and next country, and the next one, what's going to be? We see in Russia just dictators and a bunch of mafia people over there that basically take all the resources, they take everything from the people over there and they treat everyone like shit in the country in the end. We cannot say anything about against the Russian government. You cannot say anything basic about the oligarchs over there because you can go to prison in Russia. So what's gonna be if Russia take one country after other country after other country? It's gonna be worse than fucking Nazis in the in the in the forties and the thirties, a hundred percent. Few more questions then we'll wrap up would you say that the reason that you fought or the reason that you were engaged in military service has changed as you've moved on from the brazilian military to pmc a private military company work in afghanistan and other places to where you are now your motivations as a soldier have they changed and how have they changed if they have uh when i work as a pmc is for money mm -hmm. right no can, idea. can i also ask a blunt question here yes do you, do you think at all, what do you think of the word mercenary, soldier of fortune, the idea that, you know, you were going around the world working for these private military companies, you were doing it for money, not ideology. Would you, would you say that you were a mercenary or would you say you don't like that term because of the stigma or there's a difference between a PMC contractor and a mercenary? Yeah, one thing is different than other things. Mm -hmm. uh, when you work as a PMC, like you work as a PMC, I work here. Well, for for money, mm -hmm. but I have to have a contract with a company. Mm -hmm. This is a security company, so in the end, I'm kind of security. Mm -hmm. PMEC, what is the job of the PMEC? Is just go there and fight? No, PMEC. This is not his job. You know, his job is to protect whatever company. You know, he have to protect. For example, you have a gas company, you have to comp to protect the compound. You have a oil company. Sometimes you have to work with uh, uh, those direct uh, uh, di um, directors of those companies and escort those people, for example, in high risk area. You, you're not there to, to, to work as a soldier. You're there to work as a security. You there to well, what the, what's the key difference that you weren't engaged in active combat or yeah we're not allowed to do the kind of things gotcha all right so, we so it's very different than say what was happening in the congo in the 60s and 70s it's a very different type of work. yes mercenary the go and fight like army 
mm-hmm. like Wagner PMC. This is not a, a PMC company. This is a terrorist organization. Mm-hmm. Okay, these people come also with the Russian army inside Ukraine and fight against the Ukrainian uh, army. Okay, this is not PMC. PMC don't do this kind of work. PMC work as a security, no as a combat uh, uh, infantry or whatever it is. You know what I mean? We don't engage with other army, mm-hmm. you know, uh, as a PMC. As I said, PMC, the work of, of uh, PMC is to do the security, provide security for companies, for, um, you know, uh, the, the kind of things. Mm-hmm. It's the same you, you will see sometimes, you know, like the security work in the bank. Security work in the bank, he not work as a police, yes? Mm-hmm. He just work inside, he have a weapon and everything, but he not allowed to go to the street and he's trying to arrest people. Mm-hmm. He's not allowed to go to the street and see some criminal shooting someone and go there and trying to shoot the criminal too. He's not allowed to do that kind of things. The same thing with PMC. PMC, they have a specific job to work as a security. Mercenary like those Russians, uh, Wagner group terrorists, they come inside Ukraine, they fight here inside Ukraine as a soldiers and the same thing they did over there in Syria, mm-hmm. you know. They do, I think, the same thing until now over there in Syria. They fight as a soldiers. It's not like a security company. Mm-hmm. It's a different story. Gotcha. So, so your motivations though used to be profit, uh, soldier of fortune. I don't know how you would define it, but you were uh, working for money, and your motivations have changed since then. How have they changed? As you know, you've gotten a family now in Ukraine. Obviously, now you feel like you're probably fighting for something a lot different because there's not a lot of money to be made into territorial defense. No, basically no money here, man. Look, they have people here. Just to make more clear to people understand here, okay? Uh, as a PMC, you work as a security, make some salary. It's not like, oh, a lot of money. When you say like soldiers of fortune or something, people really think, oh, make like $100,000 per month. No, the salary of PMC is like between two, uh, between $3,000 to whatever, $10,000. Mm-hmm. $10,000, oh, you very well pay. Mm-hmm. So this is not nothing to make millionaire. Mm-hmm. Something just to have if you make ten thousand dollars. If you more lock. than the average soldier would make in normal service. Yes, that's we, why a lot of sol- That's also why a lot of people don't want to serve it. once they're finished with regular service. They want to go to work for the PMCs exactly. because you're making a lot more money with the PMCs than you are with the regular. Yeah, army. but but this is the thing. How much the uh, American soldier they make today in the army? Oh, I don't know, like a thousand dollars a month, maybe. I don't know. A thousand dollars, thousand and a half, something like that. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, how much money the PMC make? Five thousand? Something like that. You see? It's no like to be a millionaire. It's, something, it's a regular work. So, mm-hmm. right? This is the first thing. Uh, okay, now I I'm work, uh, I don't work as a PMC. I'm here in Ukraine, fight for Ukraine, blah, blah, blah. You know, I have my salary here. You know how much money I make last month? I'm very curious, how much? Five hundred dollars. For, for the entire month? Yes. Five hundred dollars. This for money for my fuel and things. People in my channel they give you three times, four times more money for me. Even sometimes even more. So you make more money on YouTube than yes, you do in your. Yes, I make much more service. money on YouTube than I make here in the, uh, in the army. You know, like I'm supposed to make a little more because I'm in some region right now. It, it works like this. If you you stay in a safe place or something like that, you know, your salary is like 500. If you go more close to the front lines, you know, like I am right now, uh, you make, I think, 80,000 grievances, about $2,000 or something like that. Mm-hmm. It should be, right? And if you're in the front line right now, you make around three thousand dollars, like right there, the front line, assault teams, any kind of things, you know, mm-hmm. make around three thousand dollars per month, and you have to be there all the time. Mm -hmm. because they calculate how many days we spend there. Would you say that type of work is a lot more dangerous than the type of stuff that you were doing in Afghanistan? Yeah, 100%. 100% more dangerous. Because if you work as a PMC in some place, uh, normally it's hostile, but you know, you know more or less how to manage the situation and 
you don't have artillery, airplanes, and that kind of shit in your head. You don't have missiles. Here you have missiles, you have helicopters, you have all this shit every single day. All the time they try to bomb your position and try to kill you. So I, I do want to go back to the, the, how your motivations have changed. Um, how have your motivations changed now that you have a family in Ukraine and you're fighting with, with the Ukrainian military now? How have your motivations changed from what you used to be doing? It's simple to explain. Fight for my home. This is my home now. If someone invade the, uh, where, where are you living, West? I live in Maryland, right outside of Washington D.C. I right. I've been there like a couple of times. You like it? Place. Yeah, I like it. That's good. It's a good place. Yes. So, uh, imagine if some foreign country invade exactly your city. Mm -hmm. What are you gonna do? You gonna fight? Yes. Most likely, yeah. Yes. Most certainly. That's why. This is my motivation here. You know, I fight because someone invade my territory, invade my 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 country. Because I, I'm not from Ukraine, but I live in Ukraine. My family is here in Ukraine, so I need to fight for this country too. You know, and I fight for my friends. My friends fight for me too. So that's why I keep in fighting for the people. No matter what I do here, I I gonna continue to fight for this country or work in the military. You know, being the assault team or being the logistic or being the recon or be whatever it is in the drone uh, team. Is there any of those that you specifically prefer? Like any, like do you prefer assault work? Do you prefer logistics? Do you prefer something else? I can, I think I can do all those things. You know, but. One thing that I'm gonna do right now with a group of Americans, uh, we starting to set up a, a group of drone operators, mm -hmm. and I think this is super cool to do. You you prefer doing the drone work right now? Yes, first of all because it's more safe. It's safer. Yes, much safer. Yes, because we stay a little bit more far from these people. Of course, if you find your location, you're done. You know, mm -hmm. but it's more safer. Plus. I think this kind of wars we're gonna fight in the future, you know, and we fight right now. Um, that kind of techniques with drones, I think this is the future of war. Future of warfare? Yes. So that's why I think it's a nice work to do. Do you think a lot of these Western companies or, you know, planners around the world are looking to Ukraine and how drones are being used and they're studying it and using it? To, for their own militaries and they're, they're thinking about integrating what they're seeing here yeah there's a bunch of people they come to studying you know what's going on here mm -hmm. you know um i give all I give, let me give you a few examples to you right? sure. in the beginning of the war we just use a regular uh dgi drones i have one like this yeah, the, the commercial one yes yeah, like commercial ones one. exactly was super useful you know uh then you know Ukrainian people is very intelligent people, it's very smart people. They're starting to use these drones, they're starting to uh, use another techniques. And I mean like, um, okay, now what about if I put a grenade here and just launch the grenades in the rushes? Oh, what about, so the thing is trying to upgrade, you know, like day by day, day by day, day by day. Now we have like a, a group of drones operators then have their own um, engineers and they make vehicles. I have a friend right now. He, all the money he makes in the army, he used the money and his uh, guys too use the money to make uh, vehicles. You know, so they use the remote control, the heavy cameras and everything, grenade launchers, uh, machine guns and the drone. Uh, it's very silent because they use um, those uh, electric motors. They can run like 60 kilometers, 100 kilometers, like um, 30, 40 kilometers per hour. And they use that kind of uh, technology right now. They use the kind of things right now. The people innovate, the people create. I see like other groups of um, Ukrainians, you know, they get together, they make uh, different kind of drones, like the ones with wings, they fly, kamikaze, the uh, quadri quadricopters, they use those a lot too, SPV drones, they use a lot of too, sometimes the guys just get parts here, parts of theirs, they make their own drones, so there's a lot of creation here, and they have few 
they have a few uh, new companies here in Ukraine, they just start from scratch. Mm -hmm. And also those guys, they become very creative. And I think this is the future of the war. A lot of countries, they come here in Ukraine right now to be studying what's going on here. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think it's, it's Ukraine's being used in a way also as like a testing ground 100%. for a lot of these new weapons. Like I know, um, just the switchblade drones and stuff like that are being sent over. They're really looking at those results for how they perform in these environments. Yeah, yeah. Because a lot of these equipment, you know, they've been testing them in like controlled, you know, sterile kind of, you know, science and like Raytheon environments and they're like factories, but they haven't been able to test them in an active hot war. And do you think Ukraine's being used that way in any way? As, yeah. as a testing ground? Yes, I think so. Not just drones, but I think a lot of different weapons. First of all, high Mars. Mm -hmm. right? We use high Mars in Afghanistan, Iraq, or something like that. But now high Mars is known worldwide. I mean, nobody knew about high Mars exactly. before. Everyone knows high Mars now. Yes. I mean, Raytheon, I mean, I mean, I hate to be kind of like cold about it, but I mean, what better advertisement for a weapon than seeing how effective yeah. the HIMARS has been in this war? Exactly. Look, uh, not just HIMARS, look by Rektar. Do you remember Rektar? Yeah, the tur yeah, I mean, they had, the, I don't know if you heard the song, they yes, like a song exactly. where they were by yeah. Rektar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why? Because people made a big propaganda, not just a propaganda, a big advertising here in this country, you know, because the, war, the, the because those kind of weapons really works. If it doesn't work, nobody cares, but Bayraktar really works, it was very effective in the beginning of the war, it's still in use today, you know, high Mars also, and other kind of weapons for sure, look, javelin, mm -hmm. you know, any loss, you know, and nobody knows about any loss, but if you're asking people right now, everybody knows what's any loss, any loss is a very effective weapon, by the way. I used that. You used them? Yeah. When did you use them? Here in uh, Ukraine, uh, when the Russians were here in Did Yuping. you use it to disable any Russian vehicles? Yes. It was few in the cars, like all the time. We have like three of those and few other uh, rocket launchers inside of the car, like those Soviet ones. And we use that sometimes. Would it perform better than the old Soviet rocket launchers on PGs? A hundred percent. So good. The thing is really good. RPGs is really good for ambushes, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, it's nice, you know. But is that how you you were using them during those ambushes you yes, described earlier? We use that right here. I use that too, you know. I think I have a video somewhere. I think in my Instagram. I don't remember now with those things with me and everything. Yeah, what's good to use? It's a nice thing to operate. So I want to. I want one last line of questioning. I want to talk specifically about the Legion. He's been serving for the Le with the Legion for about two months now. Was it? You said about two months. About two months. Yeah. What's your impression of the International Legion after two months of service? Well, I'm going to be very honest here, okay. right? very honest, and I hope people don't get upset with me what I have to it's, say. This series is called Ukraine Uncensored. We want as brutal honesty as possible. I know. Okay. We have a, a lot of good guys in the Legion, a lot of good guys, really good guys from many different countries. We have Spanish, Brazilians, Italians, we have... Uh, Swedish people, we have Norwegians, Americans, British. Uh, can, I, can I ask you, what was the one nationality that you saw that surprised you the most? Uh, I think it was two, by the way. Israel or Israeli or just like? No, Japan. Oh, Japan, gotcha. And uh, South Korea. South Korea, really? Yes. Huh. They have one guy in my team right now from South Korea. You know, so it was very surprised for me because for me, it's, you know, looks so far, you know what I mean, from from this war. But at the same time, it's not so far from this war because Japan also it's, have a border with Russia and um, South Korea is just there, close to China and also close to Russia. But it was a surprise for me. And there's also the the stories about possible North Korean munitions being used and stuff like that. Uh, exactly. So it was some kind of surprise for me. So, anyways. Um, what I think about Legion, okay, about guys, like a bunch of nice, good guys, many uh, good soldiers, many of them, I think 90% 90, 90 of the guys here is really good guys, like good soldiers, mm -hmm. right? One of them, you find one, there's no like 
too good. But the rest, the nine. 90% was I said it's really good guys well training they know what to do and everything the one out of ten you were kind of talking about it earlier some people who came here with like maybe like thrill seekers or thinking war is kind of like Call of Duty or something exactly. like that exactly yeah in the those beginning, guys kind of got filtered out from what I've heard though unless I'm wrong yeah I know got the, filtered. You know, the, the filter so far a lot you know combat will filter them out yeah in the, the, in the beginning in the beginning it was a, I think maybe I think it was the opposite. Maybe ninety percent of the people that come here, they come from this Call of Duty battlefield mentality. Mm. Right? Just off calling off. like, where's the airstrikes? Where's the air? Yeah, exactly. Like just for fun, or you know, to uh, make uh, pictures and videos for Facebook or whatever. Get a girlfriend. Media. You know. Exactly. Um, now we have less people than before, you know, and less people they come, but still um, everyday people come, you know, to help. Uh, but the people they come now is different because people they come now, they know exactly what's going on here, mm -hmm. you know, because they have friends here, they still fight in Ukraine. And those friends they still fight here in Ukraine for sure they say the truth what's going on here. Look, this is no fucking video game. One shot, you can be dead. One artillery, you can just blow in pieces. If you step in the mine, you can just blow your fucking leg and you fucking dumb. You know, they know that shit. They know the reality, they know the dangers. So the people they come here now, I see a lot of professional people, but it's still one or two, you know still have this call of duty mentality but those people don't stay here for too long you know they stay here like this guy stay one day and left the other guys also stay maybe a week two and just leave you because mm -hmm. they don't want you to stay here because the reality is is hard you know so about soldiers about uh you know um, soldiers like it's just Unbelievable guys, pretty good, really decent, nice guys. I met so many good guys here. For a lot of people, you know, watching this when they when they watch it, most people haven't served in the military. But if they were to serve in the military, the scenarios they would draw up for why they would would be, you know, by town got invaded, I'm gonna defend my family. It's very hard for a lot of people to wrap their heads around somebody leaving their home, going to a country which many of these guys have never been to to fight for Ukrainian liberation, to fight for Ukrainian democracy, whatever reasons they give. What type of reasons do they give you when, when they talk about why they're here? Except what I said in the beginning, you know, for the right thing. This is the right thing to do. Fight for the people of this country, fight for uh, also for the whole Europe, fight, fight for freedom, all right? fight um, they, these people they come to fight now because they know if they don't fight now, soon or later they have to fight home. Mm -hmm. That's why those people they come here too. You know, and as I said, soldiers is just unbelievable good guys I met here. Like so many nice, decent guys. You know, basically they leave the countries with a good salaries to come here and help these people. All right, and many of them also they spend their own money in the legion. Mm -hmm. I see that. Right. Uh, my complaints about the Legion because this is the thing I say the truth and I don't give a shit about them. Mm -hmm. right. My complaints about Legion, uh, I think Legion can be a little bit more organized in a good way. Right. I mean, logistic, I mean, commanders, probably, you know, like. Some what about commanders? Look, Ukraine have a, a problem with commanders and this is not new and this is uh, not a secret for anyone anymore. Mm -hmm. right? Even the military here, even the news, they're talking about this. Right? Unfortunately, in the beginning of the war, uh, we don't have a lot of commanders. Right? Like people, they really can put guys together and fight and do the whole work, like logistic, uh, also, you know, um, the training and, you know, the kind of things. Right? People was very limited, right? Because the country really need like people with high education. Um, 
uh, was necessary to put people that have low experience or sometimes no experience in the army and put as a commander. So they'll take people with not much experience and they'll put them in a leadership position? Yes. So this one, I, I understand. Is this a, is this a, I do want to ask though, is this a legion specific problem or is this a problem across the entirety of the entire army? Gotcha. Um, so this was necessary. I understand that. I see little by little the military starting really to change this, you know, starting to, or recycle some people then have some training before or it's trying to give uh, better training it's trying to prepare those people right now i understand it's very hard to do this during the war but they really try hard to do you know I really so it is improving improving yes i really believe in the military the ukrainian military i really believe in the competence of the ukrainian military i really believe that I believe in this uh, Zaluzhny, you know... Uh, yeah. Does this uh, belief in, in the competence also extend to the Legion as well, from your experience? I believe they, they improve. I believe, I believe they, they learn, but they still have a lot of things to change. Mm -hmm. You know, I have my own complaints too. You know, like... Um, I think things can be more fast mm -hmm. in the Legion, you know, when the soldiers they need more weapons or more ammo or different weapons to fight you know and more resources is that a problem of is that a, a problem that like the legion can control or is that something outside of their control because a lot of like having more supplies you know you can't really just manifest that out of out of air is that a fundraising issue yes i think that you you know if you have more support from people mm -hmm. you know like can be even better, you know, we can have a more uh, decent uh, equipments here. For example, we can have more night visions, thermoscopes. We need a lot of thermoscopes. This is right now in this war, it's not just drones. For example, in my rifle, I have my, my this is my personal rifle, right? Okay? What type of rifle do you use? Uh, I have uh, AK-74, uh, but mm -hmm. I have my personal rifle, a Savage uh, 6.5. Mm -hmm. I, with a thermoscope, pull side th thermoscope. I, those things are very expensive. Just the, the thermoscope is about five thousand dollars. You know, but it's very necessary. You and see, it's five thousand dollars, and you're making five hundred dollars a month from fighting. Exactly. Yeah. You see, just my weapons, seven thousand dollars plus, almost eight thousand dollars. How, this how much of the equipment being used by the average soldier is fundraised? Because I know so many soldiers that fundraise all the time for their units, whether it be for, you know, like headsets to protect their ears for artillery crews or thermal scope, drone guns, mm -hmm. all types of equipment. Uh, excuse me. I'm that. asking, like, wh what percentage of the equipment that the average soldier uses is fundraised? How much do they have to fundraise for the equipment? I think a lot. A lot? A lot, yes. I think um, all these things we have, like the ear protections and the uh, good helmet and uh, uh, like a uh, uh, new pair of uniforms and this is soldiers that basically provides for fundraising. You know, like I did, like I do this all the time. Just a couple of weeks ago, I give 10 uh, uniforms for the guys, 10 or 12 or something like that, ear protections and the kind of things, you know. Even a helmet, you know, like sometimes I, I buy for the guys. For example, right now I get a generator, I get a Starlink. This will be money from my pocket. Mm -hmm. I just got this Sunday, last Sunday. Do you have any thoughts on Elon? Like him, don't like him? Just uh, briefly, it's not an important topic, I'm just curious. Yeah, just for me, I don't give a shit about him, you know, like um, about what he thinks or whatever. If he help Ukraine right now with Starlink, for me it's good enough. I have nothing to say about the guy. Gotcha. Uh, okay. So the Legion uses the International Legion Fund to fundraise. That's how they get a lot of their uh, funds and resources. I've heard from my other conversations that for a lot of Legionnaires, the difficulties they run into is they don't have, a lot of them don't have roots here. A lot of them don't have family here or no people here. Uh, and so they don't have like family members that they can ask to like, hey, could you give me some money? Or hey, do you have this that I can pull from? Uh, is that why the International Legion Fund is so important? Because they just don't have the roots to, you know, they don't have the connections here mm -hmm. to be able to like, hey, I got this. Can you, you know, help me out and send this to me? Yes, fundamental, you know, this uh, part of the Legion, you know, the 
collect the resources you know for us uh, have better equipment and everything but i also believe you know like um those uh, governments from the west you know i think they needed to push a little bit the commanders of the legion you know to put a little bit more effort you know in the legion i mean like maybe some armor vehicles maybe some um uh, rocket launchers you know like um like um any law like javelin stingers you know we are in like all those things here in the legion i think if this is a foreign legion you know and um, the governments from foreigner countries like us and the uk spain and you know different other uh, countries they give all the support for, uh, for the ukrainian soldiers i think they have to look a little bit to us too you know, and give a little bit more support for us. Got you. Uh, I actually read recently that the Ukrainian government has only had 15% of its requests for demining equipment fulfilled. Uh, and I spent a month, I lived with deminers for a month, I filmed with them trying to document, you know, the conditions they face. And they have to fundraise for everything. Um, they, they desperately need more demining vehicles, they desperately need more drones for service. Uh, how important is demining equipment? and more demining equipment for the counteroffensive, say, in Zaporozhye, which is still ongoing? Okay, I can say this is fundamental right now, 100%. Uh, mm -hmm. If we don't have this, it's going to be basically impossible to continue at events, because, as I said in this interview, so many mines in all the fields all across Ukraine, if you go to Kharkiv region, Luhansk region, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, Kherson, um, mine is everywhere. We desperately need that kind of, of equipment here in Ukraine. If we don't have in quantity, it's going to be very hard. Listen, I mean, Ukrainian soldiers and Ukrainian army just sometimes people think, um, you know. Um, this uh, Ukrainian army is very slow right now or people complain about you know different things you know but what I can say about the Ukrainian soldiers and the Ukrainian army is just unbelievable the resilience and the commitment that these people have for this country is just unbelievable because these people sometimes they fight with minimal but they continue to fight you know I mean like if you would have just would you say the morale situation is, is is positive in Ukraine? It's very positive, I think. You know, people of course people tired about war, you know, because war is not funny, you know, and this is not nice when you see your cities getting destroyed, you know, when you see like your family, you know, uh, getting killed, your friends getting killed in the war, this is not funny, you know. When you see like uh, more than 50%, 60% of the economy of your country is completely destroyed. You know, when you see a lot of people have no jobs, you know, and people live with uh, humanitarian, a lot of people in this country just live like that. This is not fun, but in the same time, you know, of course, people really think about this and this is really bad and everything. We want to this war finish as soon as possible. We really want that, but at the same time, if we need to continue to fight another five years, we're going to continue to fight another five years. You don't think there's any quit in Ukraine? There, there's no chance they would ever throw in the towel? No. I think this is zero chance to this happen. For a simple of simple reason. If we stop and fight, we lose the country. You know, not just the war, we lose the country, 100%. When the Russians start to advance and attack in one position, like they did in Bahmut, all the city they move to other place. People have to evacuate. Otherwise, everyone's going to be killed. That's mean what? These people is going to go back to their region again? No, the Russians going to take some piece of shit Russians from I don't know where, and they're going to put in that region. I know they've been doing. Um, I know they've been having a lot of settlers in Mariupol recently. They had this. They did this also in Crimea after they invaded a lot of people. A lot of Russians moved to Crimea. A lot. 
And this is exactly what happened. They're trying to put all these Russians from Siberia, from other regions of their Russia, far from this part here of the, you know, f far from this uh, this part of the world, you know, like people live like 5,000 kilometers, 6,000 kilometers from here, mm -hmm. you know. So they're trying to get all those people now and put here. And you get the Ukrainians, this is, you know, um, no something this is not something from my head this is a real thing here okay they get the ukrainians they get the ukrainian uh, uh, kids and they take to far away east of russia right now like thousands of families they basically get kidnapped from ukraine and send it to uh, to the east of russia and the people from east of russia they put it here inside the ukraine right now so I, I'm, I don't want to keep you any longer because I've kept you for well over the time I expected to, but this interview was extremely interesting. Uh, thank you so much for giving me all this time to, to talk. Um, if you want to tell people where they could find uh, you know, your channel, because I know you have a YouTube channel, um, and if there's anything you want to shout out, uh, whether it be the International Legion Fund or a message you would want to give to the people that watch this interview, now would be the time to do that. I always give people you know, a chance to say whatever they want at the end of the, uh, the, end of the interview. All right. So what I'm going to tell the people here, okay, uh, thank you very much for the support. Please continue to support Ukraine. This is very important. What we do here, we fight for us, but we fight for you too, guys. Uh, guys, they want to come to Ukraine. It's going to be more than welcome. But as I said in the beginning, you know, this is not a joke. This is not a video game. You know, you just have one life. It's not video game. You have many. Just really think about before you come to Ukraine to fight here. But if you come to fight, you're more than welcome to fight here in this country. Another thing about your collaboration, okay? Um, it's very important for us if people really donate for the soldiers here, for the foreign legion, because we are in lack of a lot of things, of course, and we need all those things, as I said here in this interview. We need thermoscopes, we need drones, we need, you know, better equipment. We need basically a lot of different things right here. And every help is more than welcome, you know. So thank you very much for this opportunity. All right. Uh, if it's someone wants to see my work, it just goes to my Telegram. Um, Telegram. I have a Telegram channel, a Telegram group, but it's in Portuguese because I speak with people from Portugal in Brazil. Alex Silva 300, 300, and Alex Silva 3.0. This is my group on Telegram. And my channel on YouTube, I speak also in Portuguese. I make lives over there once in a while. I explain about the situation here in the war. People then understand Portuguese because I try to bring to the Brazilian people and for, for the Portuguese people exactly what happened inside the Ukraine. Uh, my channel on YouTube, Alex Silva 3.0. That's Alex spelled A L E X and Silva spelled S I L V A. Yeah, yes. Yeah. All right. So this is my YouTube channel. People's more than welcome to come. But you have to understand Portuguese, of course, because they speak Portuguese over there. I'm sorry also for, you know, um, if my English is not perfect, you know, but I think people understand me. Hey, I don't need to pay for a translator, so I'm very happy. I'm oh. very happy to speak in English. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do the interview. I know it was long, but you were a great interview subject. Thank you, buddy. Thank you for watching this Ukraine Uncensored interview. I hope this first-hand testimony of the war in Ukraine helped you better understand those who are caught in the violent throes of history. We have a bunch of other videos interviewing those affected by the war on the ground in Ukraine that you can check out on my channel. If you want to help fund my work so I can do more interviews like this in the future, please support me at my Dylan Burns TV Patreon page. I have a second YouTube channel called Dylan Burns Live where you can see my videos from my live stream, which you can view on my Twitch or on my website, DylanBurns.tv every weekday from 6 p.m. EST to midnight. And if you want my hot takes or photos from my time in Ukraine, check out my socials, including at DylanBurns1776 on Twitter and DylanBurnsTV on Instagram. All links, including a community Discord, are in the description below. See you guys next time.